Um, let's see, 608, so there's your force. Right. Um, content, everything's under content. Oh, I will call attention to uh, a tutoring service, very fine. Do a Zoom tutoring with students on Sundays, Mondays, and Wednesdays, and those time spots. If you can't get in touch with me or you just want to see a different face. Oh, there's Michelle. Okay, so everybody's here. Some form or fashion. All right. Only point of the course. Um, this is not only a face to face course, but everything I give you, this for the benefit of the newbies, everything I give you in, in the class handout here is duplicated in Brightspace. So if your dog eats your homework, you can get their copy. Um, Oh. There we go. All right, so let's set that back. There we go. All right. Um, homework. You guys have your uh, have purchased thing made yet? Okay. Or have purchased it for another course? That's doesn't matter. If it's unlimited uh, and you buy a year, you've got two semester courses. So uh, be sure and register when you do register. I haven't checked, maybe you're already registered. Uh, register through this portal. I must have put it someplace else. I, put it someplace else? I couldn't get it to work. Uh -oh. Do you have like an access code? No. Uh -huh. Oh, I thought mine to work because I already have unlimited and I went into a homework assignment. Just okay. My like uh, chemistry book from last semester just disappeared off my home page. So like I don't know how to get it back. Did you uh, did you buy a semester or a whole year? A whole year. Okay. So what you need to do is go to let's see. Office hours. Here we go. Send page office hours. If you uh, during these hours and on those on those days up until February seventeenth. You can go to this link right here and have a troubleshoot your problem. Okay. Um, here's a separate course schedule. There's homework registration. Yeah. Ah, here it is. No, there it is. Okay. I usually put it at the top. Let me move it back up here. It's a good thing I'm in here as an instructor so I can do these things. Uh, that's all I need. Snap foods on the first bed. Let's go to this position. And let's move it. Oh, I know what the problem is. I put that stuff in there. Uh, this stuff up here, I put it in under the uh, description, logical description. There's no position of it. So this is the first place you can get to. It. So you should be able to go in here. Now, if I go in there, it's going to think I'm an instructor, so it won't do you any good for me to demonstrate that. Um, this is where you connect to the Zoom class meetings. Or you can do it like I did from the, uh, from the portal. You can go down to the Zoom portal. Look for the course there. Either way, this learning module is where everything is. It's where everything's located. So I find it easier to go down the left hand side first. And uh, oh, the point I wanted to make beyond the fact that you've got PowerPoint slides here in three different flavors, those are all the same PowerPoint slides for that chapter. Uh, We've got review documents. We've got keys to the review document. So I didn't hand out a key, so that's where you find the answers in the review document. 
And these are work problems. They're handwritten solutions to every problem that they work to review down to. Um, and here's your homework connection. That's probably where you connected one of these, right? Just clicked on one of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it said that I did it. When I clicked on it, it said I completed it. So I was like, oh, I find a job. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. No. no. It should give you a chance to go back in and get more kind of support. Okay. Yeah. If it doesn't, let me know. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wipe out your attempts and you shouldn't be able to go back in. Oh, thank you. Um, these are all archive videos here, including these. I have to move these into archive because I'm going to uh, populate with brand new videos from our class sessions. But if you're interested in there, uh, self help, you can do that if you want. Um, exams. Um, you're able to, well, I should say this first. <clears throat> On the days we have exams, there won't be any labs. Okay, see, so that's guaranteed. Uh, for two reasons. One is we've got too much material to cover and not overlap into the lab session to get things done after the um, after you complete the exam. That's if you come in face to face. You'll probably be coming in face to face, right? Okay. But if uh, if the weather doesn't permit or you have a long drive like I've, I teach down in Logan and I've got one student that drives an hour and a half so they're uh, um, I drive farther than they do but not much <clears throat> but um, the exam that I give in paper is duplicated in uh, Brightspace and it's proctored by respondents monitor and lockdown browser so are you familiar with those okay you are no. Okay. The first time you go in to take, if you do it that way, first time you go in to take it, let me just show you. Um, I should be able to, this is an alternate way to take it. Let's see, I want to preview it. So let me do it this way. And this is what you should see. Or this would be for exam two. You go down and uh, there are some instructions. And if you don't have, um, respond as a lockdown browser installed on your computer yet. Just click on this thing here and it will install it. And then when you launch the lockdown browser, it'll take you toward, toward the exam, but you've got to go through some steps. If you've ever done these uh, virtual proctors before, they have you, uh, they take an image of your face and you have to show them the ID and you have to take your computer and uh, scan the room okay. with your camera, or if you have a camera remote, you can take it off. Um, there are a couple of other things, I think, but eventually it lets you into the exam. Once you're into the exam, uh, it'll also ask you, the lockdown browser will check to see if you've got any uh, contraband applications running in the background. So you have to shut those down. <clears throat> but eventually, You'll get into the exam, and uh, uh, you take the exam in one sitting. It won't let you out. You got to finish it. But and it's got a timer on it. But I set it up so that the timer is is just recommended. So if you go long, that's okay. It just tells me that you went over the time. There's no penalty for it. So no panic. Just. When it said when it's, if it pops up a timer, that's just for to let you know that uh, the recommended time is really bad. But you can take as long as you need to finish it. And then I've also got a facility in there at the end of the exam. If there are any problems in there where you need to show your work, then you can you can hold your scratch paper up and it'll take a picture of it. Now, sometimes I have uh, extra credit problems and you have to show your work. But I don't have any extra credit assignments this semester. We did last semester, but not this semester. So any extra credits or bonuses will be on the exams. Okay, so that's how you can take the exam um, remotely if you have to.
you run into any kind of conflict, work conflict, family conflicts, weather conflicts, um, you can take it away. Okay, uh, let's see. That was one major point I wanted to make. Let me see if there are any others. Um, let's see, we're in exam two. Okay. I think that's pretty much it. The rest of the modules, and it gets kind of busy over here. So sometimes what I do is I click here on the table of contents or start here and collapse everything. And then it's a little easier to manage. Uh, there's a duplication of uh, the schedule. So let's look at um, so here's the syllabus. So you have a copy of my schedule that shows you where I am and what I am. And then there my office hours are just there in the yellow highlights on the dark red background and uh you can zoom in there or you can come to my office for two of those days the first day like today monday i always zoom those from home because they're late has some late hours <clears throat> if you have any trouble um, if you're going to come by here in person it's probably a good idea to text me a cell phone to me to, to text me or uh, a call be sure about either. Otherwise, um, zooming is, is a safe bet. Uh, okay. So let's see. Here's a connection to the ebook. And you said when you click on this one, uh, you can't get into the ebook. Oh, I can get into the ebook. <clears throat> oh. It's just the homework that I'm having trouble with. The homework. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't see anything else in here that's. All this stuff you won't see. I mean, here's the instructor now. So that'll be invisible. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me uh, get out of this, just log out of that. And uh, The only reason I'm going to put the syllabus on the board is because we have some zoomers. Otherwise, we would just look at our copies. And you can do that too. It's probably easier to see your copy than it is to try to read that. But, um, so let's see, let's see the file structure. It's kind of messy. Over time, you know, it just gets more and more cluttered. It's kind of like uh, living in a house for 10 or 20 years. It gets really messy. What's the saying? Three moves is worth a fire. Every time you move, you get rid of stuff. By the time you move three times, you've got rid of everything in your own. Got all this stuff by now. <clears throat> okay, so here we are in the world two years old. So let me call this one. Uh, I'm looking. See if I can leave this full screen. Really? It's not full screen. Well, this is. I want to do one page at a time. There we go. <clears throat> okay, so hopefully. The magic wand of work. There you have my uh, uh, contact information up there on the left. And I mentioned earlier, my cell phone is right here. 
Best way to use the cell phone is text. Then I don't have to crash my car to answer the phone. <clears throat> and those are uh, my duplicated office hours right here. Um, let's down some. There's the uh, uh, Seven Gauge Unlimited. That's my big problem. If you want a hard copy, there are the particulars, but you don't have to have a hard copy. And by now, you should be able to get some used uh, used version from Amazon. You need a cal scientific calculator. Everybody's got a scientific calculator. No. Okay. If you go to Walmart and uh, you find a pack that says scientific on it, it'll have everything you need. I got one student that wanted a Cadillac, so she got a graphing calculator. It's got everything too. <clears throat> uh, okay, so if you're going to use um, lockdown browser respondents, or if you're going to zoom in, of course, you need a, a webcam. So if you, your laptop should have one built in. <clears throat> um, that's useful, but not important for the moment. Um, there will be regular exams, and there we'll talk about those when we get to the schedule. The homework homework uh, is due on the chapters that are part of the exam on the same day as the exam, so they're they're all coordinated. Um, you get ten percent credit for attendance. That's good and participation. Um, so there's the the grading scale. I'm on a, on a ten point scale. Your chapter exams are worth 70%. There's no final exam. There's no time for a final. There's no, no time. Actually, there's no time for a review. That's what I'm concerned with. We can't review, then uh, I'm not going to have a final. And there's there's no room for it for a uh, review session and final two. And 20% for your homework. So here comes the schedule. Let me see if I can. Yeah, the whole thing's up there. Okay, so I've, I've highlighted the stuff that's important for due dates, like homework and exams are on these days. And if you compare side by side with the uh, lab schedule, uh, I haven't handed that out yet, then you'll find that every time we have one of these, there's no lab. So what we'll do is have the exam, and then we'll go straight into the next chapter <clears throat> on that day, and that'll overlap into the lab time. Now, if you have to, uh, if nature calls, just hop up and go. You don't have to raise your hand or ask permission. If you have a cell phone, most people do, uh, mute your phone, put it on vibrate. So if you do get a call, if you're expecting a call, then you can hop up and go out and take a call. <clears throat> um, let's see, what else? It's, it's pretty methodical right we'll have a, an exam well we'll have a, a scheduled review session so on these days we'll have reviews and labs except for this first one i don't think we have a lab on that day the first lab is on chemical kinetics so we have to cover the material first so we'll have the material here and then we'll have a lab stuff right in there okay so we're gonna be sure and cover the material before we go in the lab <clears throat> <clears throat> Um, I've highlighted some other things in here, like uh, this Monday is spring break, and it's also when the mid-semester grades are due. So we'll have um, three homeworks and three uh, exams grades go into your mid-semester mid grade, and that should give you a pretty good idea of where you stand and where you're headed. Um, there's another one, last day to drop with a W, and then final. Final grades are due here. This last exam is during finals week. So unless the college tells me to move it to a different time, we'll have it at the same time as we need here. If they don't have a final exam schedule posted for us, then, and even then, um, I prefer to have it on a time that you've, you've arranged your schedule to come to class at this time. So why not have the exam at the same time? So um, 
unless you have a conflict with another course and their exams in the finals week, then we'll have that exam same time, same station. Okay, stop me for questions anytime. Um, the chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, and 15, 16, 17, 18. So we're going up through 18, from 10 to 18 uh, in your textbook. All right, let's see if there's anything else of interest here. Oh, I'm supposed to call your attention. Administrative withdrawal procedure. Uh, students in my chemistry classes uh, rarely have a problem with that. Uh, if you're absent for two weeks in a row and there's no contact at all, in other words, as far as I'm concerned, you dropped off the face of the earth, then I have to tell the registrar and they withdraw you from the course. Um, let's see, I'm going to let you read that other stuff. There's how you connect with my office. There's my ID, but I should, did I, I didn't stop to think. Um, when we were in Brightspace, was there a, a connection for my office hours? There was, wasn't there? A link. Should have been a link in there. If not, um, it's right. That's the Zoom ID. So if you know how to operate Zoom, you call up Zoom, then you just plug that ID in and get to me that way. If you have any trouble, let me know about alternate means. <clears throat> uh, okay, so those are some policies that we have to put in our syllabi. There's appendix. This appendix is for homework. So some blurbs about homework. Um, so you can read that. Here's, here's another. Um, this is the office hours for uh, Cengage. It's a, it's a duplicate of what you see in, in the, the uh, Brightspace course. And if you can't get help from, from their office hours, Dee Frederick uh, put her contact information in there too. She's their sales rep. Uh, if you call her, you can't get satisfaction from IT, call her and she'll get, she'll get it done. I'll be sad to see her go. I, I know she's eventually going to retire, but I hope she does before I retire because she's good. Uh, Respondents monitor lockdown browser here. Uh, this just this is the preferred method for installation, and I've mentioned that earlier when we were in there. Just click on that link and start the installation process. Used to be harder than that when we had Blackboard. You had to install it separate from Blackboard, and then you could use it. But this is one of the bright spots in Brightspace, is you can install it from within Brightspace. Of course, everything else about Brightspace sucks. That's good. <clears throat> okay, that's an alternate method. Uh, you probably won't have to use that. You can use an iPad. They've upgraded their... Uh, browser so you can use an iPad now if you have one. I don't do Apple, so don't ask me questions about that. Uh, Apple products don't play well with others. Uh, plus they're all made in China. <laughs> with slave labor. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, if you are going to use the um, uh, respond to lockdown option for your exams. The first one will not open until you do your practice exam. The practice exam is there. I don't remember seeing it in there. It should be in there. I'll check it later to be sure. The practice exam is there for you to check your equipment. It doesn't matter what the answer to the, there's one question. Answer that one question any way you want. Uh, and it's not great at any point. Uh, it just checks your equipment so that you won't go into your first exam and your equipment snafus and so you'll be ready for it. That's what the practice test is for. There's no syllabus test. This we had a syllabus test the first one, didn't we? Yeah, there's no syllabus test this in this course. 
Okay. Um, and this is uh, attending class at Zoom. So there's your, uh, let's see, inner meeting ID. Yeah, this is the, the Zoom link. Uh, you can do it through Brightspace or through the Zoom from the, the main page, or you can cut and paste this if you want. You know, you have several options. And the fourth appendix, this is a uh, this is a neat thing that uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you're if you're zooming from home, and um, of course it doesn't work for the course the way I'm doing it here, but if I zoom the if I zoom the class from home, then I can share the PowerPoint slides or I can share other documents. And in that case, there's going to be me on one side and the share on the other side. And you can you can change the size so you can make me real small and make the other the documents big. And this is a side by side mode. And this is how you can set it up so that it automatically remembers what you did the last time. And it'll but if I'm zooming from here, it's just it's just one camera and one thing I can't share. Well, I could share, but I don't think you would be able to see it. People at home would be able to see it. Okay, I think that's my last appendix, and that's enough. I'm wasting too much time already. We got to cover two chapters today. Okay, any questions? All right. So, let me think. Um, All right, so I've given you PowerPoint slides. I've given you the review document. So what do you do with the review document? Review document is uh, heavier than anything. A lot more questions in the review document give you practice. So don't think that the exam, even though it looks like an exam, don't think the exam will be that big. It'll be a lot smaller. Anyway. But um, since you guys weren't in my first class, uh, my two mottos, actually, your two best friends. Remember what they are? You don't remember? <laughs> All we need is a vacation and forget. <clears throat> your two best friends in this class are curiosity. Uh, you always want to know more about something. Why it happens. You're never says. And the other is boredom. Right? If you work enough of these problems, you're going to get bored working because there's so there's some of them repeat themselves. With slight tweaks here and there, but eventually you get to the place where you recognize the form and the type of problem that you're solving, and you know you can get tired of it. I mean, I never get tired of it, but uh, if you are bored, that's a good sign. That means you work enough. Like and if you work on, if you can work every problem with those review documents, you'll have no problem. Okay, so let me close this thing and start up. Here we go. No, I'm sorry. I'm staying. We're in the wrong folder. There we go. Yeah, I'm going to open up 10 and 11. Oops, wrong list. Yeah. This is 11, so I'm going to minimize that one. There's 10. Okay, is it showing? Yeah, it's showing good. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> So a lot of what we're going to get in this chapter on um, liquids and solids, um, I guess technically it could be considered chemistry, but a lot of it is, is physics. And uh, don't, the anxiety level should not be increasing just because of that. 
Right. Does anybody have physics in here? Physics, no physics. Okay. When we get to the point where I, I need to explain something, I'll do that. <clears throat> Liquids and solids. What we're considering in this chapter is how do molecules interact? How do ions interact um, with uh, molecular compounds like uh, water, like carbon dioxide, those that have covalent bonds that hold the molecules together in discrete units, they can interact with one another. So in the beginning, we'll start off with pure substances like, uh, like water. How do water molecules interact? Well, the bonding that's uh, uh, part of the system uh, comes in two flavors. One is uh, intramolecular bonding, which is within the molecule, right? We've studied those covalent bonds. We finished off the uh, first semester with uh, bonding ad nauseum. <clears throat> um, that's what holds the molecules together. And these are uh, real, really strong bonds, and they, they cause the molecule to be a discrete unit. And then how does it interact with its neighbors? That's the intermolecular bonding, right? There can be some, some interaction. We studied um, various models of how uh, atoms and molecules interact. And we typically treated the molecules as if they were uh, non-interacting entities, like they were just billiard balls. And when they interacted, they just bounce off each other. No interaction at all. Well, we know that's not true. They do interact. Some repel, some attract. The attractive forces, these intermolecular forces, um, are first and foremost much weaker than the intramolecular forces. And that just stands to reason. The intramolecular forces um, have to be stronger than the intermolecular forces. Otherwise, the forces that are acting on the outside of the molecule will just rip it apart. Okay, it just makes sense. So uh, we have these different types of uh, intermolecular forces based upon the character of each of the molecules. And that's, um, we typically, approach the problem uh, in terms of electrostatics. Is the molecule polar or nonpolar? We covered that at the end of the last semester, I think. Okay, so you need to be able to judge polarity. And we do that, um, well, we did it last semester by drawing the structure of the molecule using um, uh, Lewis dot structures and then the VSEPR models. And we can tell something about the structure. So. If you need to know if the molecule has a dipole, right, whether it's polar, where it has an uneven distribution of electron density on one side of the molecule versus the other, so that you can get these electrostatic interactions, then you need to judge the dipole, and you have two things that have to be considered. What, what is the polarity of the bonds? Then if, they're, if none of the bonds are polar, then you can stop there. The molecule cannot be polar. But if you do have polar bonds, then you have to consider the geometry of the molecule. If you have polar bonds and they're equal and opposite to one another, or they're uh, evenly spaced around the central atom, then they cancel one another out, and the molecule is nonpolar. Like, like uh, methane or carbon tetrachloride. Those are tetrahedral molecules with polar bonds, but they all cancel one another out. So there's nonpolar molecules. Somebody must have dropped off and came back in. <clears throat> okay, so once we've decided whether the molecules are polar and you have these dipoles, then um, the dipole can interact with another dipole on a neighboring molecule. So you get the dipole-dipole interaction. <clears throat> and what that does is it, it's evidenced in the macroscopic world as changes in boiling point, freezing point, uh, viscosity, uh, vapor pressure. 
those types of um, things that we can measure are based upon the strength of these interactions. Okay, we're going to talk about those in a few minutes. Um, there, are, there are gradations of dipole-dipole interactions. Some have very strong dipole, molecular dipoles, and they will have strong intermolecular forces. Some of them are rather weak, though. And that depends on those two things, you know, how strong, how polar are the bonds and then the, the shape of the molecule. But at the extreme end of the dipole-dipole interaction is called hydrogen bonding. And what you need for hydrogen bonding is hydrogen, <laughs> obviously, and it's connected to some other molecule, uh, some other atom. And this can be a big molecule over here, or it can be a small molecule, it doesn't matter. But as long as you have hydrogen and an electronegative a very electronegative atom here, then you get a very polar bond. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, I think on the next page we talk about, yeah, it's water. Yeah, oxygen's one of them. You can have oxygen here. Um, you can also have uh, nitrogen is also contributes to hydrogen bonding. Those are the two main ones. Uh, fluorine also. Fluorine. So those are the three biggies. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine are electronegative enough that they draw electron density away from that hydrogen. And remember, hydrogen, most of the hydrogens, uh, are just a proton and electron. So if you start removing electron density away from that hydrogen, what's left? A proton, right? It's, it's all positive there. There's nothing else there. Plus that makes it small very small, and that means that neighboring, um, say if we have oxygen here, like, like this one, let me just use what's available. This hydrogen is so small that that negative, right, the water molecule is gonna be like this, and the uh, dipole moment is like that, okay, toward the oxygen, so overall, the dipole is toward oxygen, it's negative. So you're going to have a slight negative here, slight positive there, and a slight positive there. That's a small delta. That just means that it's not a complete ion charge. It's just a, it's a in between. <clears throat> but what we see now is because these hydrogens are are there's only a proton there, and electron density is shifted away from them. That means that you can get this negative from a neighbor very close to that charge. And the strength of elect electrostatic attraction is based upon two things. How big is the charge and how close are the opposites to one another? That's Coulomb's law. That's physics, sorry. <clears throat> so that's why the hydrogen bond is so strong. Is, is the polarity of the bond and the uh, proximity of neighbors. Ooh, this is racing nice. I'm not used to that. <clears throat> okay, which are stronger, inter intramolecular? This is just a review or intermolecular. So we have to say, okay, which one's intra and inter? Intramolecular. Bonds that hold the molecule together inter between molecule. So the between molecules are weaker, that means intra is stronger. And there's a little blurb on uh, if it were the other way around, the molecule would just get ripped apart. We can't have that. <clears throat> okay. So let's look at. Um, phase changes that happen between solids and liquids and gases. <clears throat> Those are the only phases that we're really interested in. That we've only been interested in as those three phases. Uh, in the universe, you can find other phases, but actually you can find, you can find another phase in your local muffler shop. Most of them use plasma cutters now. Right? Argon plasma blown through this device that has a high voltage DC arc 
that arcs through the argon as it exits the nozzle <clears throat> ionizes it. It's coming out of there at pretty high pressure and speed. And these ions hit that muffler, uh, that tailpipe. They want to replace, you got a bad muffler or a tailpipe. They just slices through it like a hot knife through butter. That's a plasma. That's a different state of matter. <laughs> you can find it on the sun. You know, any star will have plenty of that plasma. But back to this, solids, liquids, and gases are what we were interested in. And to understand the, the phase changes, we need to get a handle on the intermolecular forces, what's holding them together, these molecules. And now um, we can discuss these uh, attraction, attractive forces in terms of the dipole, dipole that we've discussed already, but you can also have um, ions, right? One will be positive, the other will be negative. In ionic solids like sodium chloride or, or any ionic solid, be fair game. But you can also, in solutions, you can get uh, ions and dipoles interact, like dissolving salt in water. Right? So you get the dipole from the water interacting with the uh, ions from the salt as they dissolve. Now, some of them don't dissolve. We covered that last semester, didn't we? In solubility rules. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so you can get ion ions uh, and ion dipoles. Oh, I'm missing one. Um, London dispersion. That was on the slide, wasn't it? <laughs> London dispersion forces. Okay. So, if you have a nonpolar molecule, but if you get it cold enough, it'll condense from a gas into a liquid. And some of them will even go from a liquid to a solid. So how does that happen? The forces, there have to be forces to hold them together to make them into a liquid or even into a solid. Right? So where do those forces come from? They can't come from dipoles. They can't come from uh, ions. They have to come from something else. So this person right here, last name is London. I don't think he's the one that wrote the Call of the Wild. It's a different London. Um, uh, proposed the possibility that of instantaneous redistribution of electron density. So how do you get that? Well, first thing you have to realize is in a nonpolar atom or molecule, so if we have an argon atom here, right, it's pretty big. Or if you have um, a nitrogen molecule, right, nonpolar, nonpolar, either one, then those electrons are in constant motion. And for an instant, you may find that one side of the molecule, let me make room here. one side of the molecule may become for a, just a nanosecond or less. It's just a brief redistribution of electron density. That's all it takes. Well, its neighbor is gonna feel that influence, right? This positive there is going to draw electrons this direction in that molecule. So that makes this one slightly negative and that one slightly positive. Okay. And the bigger the molecules, the more effect this has. Okay, I'll explain that in a second. <clears throat> so what happens is, for this brief instant, you have uh, the potential for electrostatic attraction. And that's the force that's responsible for uh, condensation from a gas or a fusion from a, a liquid at low temperatures. They have to be low temperatures because these forces are so weak. Right? Almost any kinetic energy that's in that, in that uh, gas um, will disrupt these forces. Now, London dispersion forces are always there. For every molecule, every atom, we have the potential for these. The, the key to it is what other forces are there? Are there forces that are stronger, like the dipole-dipole? 
If they're there, then you can virtually ignore these because they're so much, much stronger, orders of magnitude stronger. Does anybody know what I mean by order of magnitude? Powers of 10. Right. So if I have this number, 10 to the first, I have this number, compare those two, that's four orders of magnitude difference. Right. Go 10 squared cubed um, to the fourth to the fifth. <clears throat> okay. So that's London dispersion forces. And you can get that same um, type of electron distribution in single atoms. Um, the noble gases will do it. Not so much helium and neon because they're too small. But the bigger you get, the chances of having electrons redistributed all around your atom uh, for an instant are much greater. So that's why we see um, uh, melting points for the noble gases as you get bigger and bigger down through that family then the temperature required to change them from a gas to a liquid goes up. You don't have to get them as cold. The, the coldest substance that we can make in the laboratory and hold in a container is liquid heating. It's about 4K. And that's what they have to use. Used to be, um, liquid helium was the only way you could get materials to be superconductive. Get them, get them that cold, then you could set a current going in a, in a loop of, of anything. And the current would just continue forever. There's no resistance at all. But now we've discovered materials that can superconduct at higher temperatures. So instead of going down to 4K for helium, which would be what? Let's test our memory here. If that's 4K, what is that in Celsius? Minus 273. So 269 uh, degrees Celsius, minus 269. That's helium liquid, okay? For comparison purposes, because I'm gonna mention something else. Now we can use liquid nitrogen. And liquid nitrogen is liquid at 195 degrees C. So you can come up, uh, what is that? 70? No, uh, well that's 70, and then five more, 69 and then five more. 74, 74 degrees difference. That's a big, that's a big jump. <clears throat> I'm wasting time. Digressing too far, I'm not gonna be able to finish the chapters. <laughs> it's a bad habit. Um, okay, so for the phase changes, we need to consider these balance of forces. And the stronger the forces, the, the higher the melting point, the higher the boiling point. So water, since water is polar, it uh, boils at 100 degrees Celsius, and it freezes at zero degrees. If, if it were not for um, the hydrogen bonding, if we were talking about, let's say, uh, well, it's written the other way around. Typically, you write it this way. Hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide, um, I don't know what the exact temperature is, but it's, it's much, much lower temperature for uh, freezing point and melting point. Because it doesn't, it's hydrogen bonding while there is not as strong. We said sulfur was a possibility for hydrogen bonding, oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative, right, because it's to the right. Well, sulfur is kind of, we didn't mention sulfur before, so technically that's not hydrogen bonding. But even so, um, the strength of those bonds is what determines these phase changes. So it's just a reminder of what things look like. Solids are fairly regular. This is this is a, a regularly arranged solid. Some solids are amorphous. The molecules are close together and they're, and they're held in position, but they're not regular in arrangement. So you, you have crystalline solids, amorphous solids. We'll talk about those more later. 
Liquids, on the other hand, they're very close together, the molecules, but the, there's enough kinetic energy in the substance so that it overcomes some of the attractive forces and allows the molecules to move past one another. That's why liquids have to be, they have to have a container. Right? They will maintain their own volume, but they won't maintain their shape. Whereas solids will do both. The gases, they're, the molecules in a gas are by comparison just miles apart. And they're moving really fast. <clears throat> I think we did a calculation last semester, didn't we? But they were, uh, some of those molecules are moving faster than the speed of sound. I'm sure we did. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, phase changes. Solid to liquid. If there's enough energy added, and when you add energy by usually by increasing temperature, adding heat, then you increase the kinetic energy of each of the molecules. And remember, kinetic. Remember the formula for kinetic energy. One half m b squared. Mass, velocity squared, that's kinetic energy. So if, if you increase the kinetic energy by changing the temperature, increasing the temperature, you can't change the mass, right? Because law of conservation of mass, you can't do that. So we have to change the velocity. So the velocity of the molecules, they're moving so fast that when they strike one another, um, they hit with such force that the attractive forces uh, are overcome. And that makes the phase change from solid to liquid to liquid to gas. Right? Is the, the battle between these intermolecular forces and kinetic energy. So think of this as a disruptive force. And the intermolecular forces are the cohesive forces. Okay. Um, okay, so and we can we can make a comparison. This is actually not a good good comparison because and I'll show you why. But solids and liquids are roughly the same density. Right? All we've done is add enough energy so that they, the liquids can slide past one another. But we've added enough energy for gases that the density goes way down. And remember the formula for density. Mass per unit volume. Mass can't, the mass doesn't change for a particular amount of substance. So if you change the volume, then you change the density. So that's, that speaks to the gases. This gets really big for gases for the same mass. And that decreases the density. Okay. Now this is a, <clears throat> this one for water, the solid is less dense than the liquid. Right. It usually it's the other way around. The solids get become a little more dense than the liquids. But for water, you have a special thing that's going on. When, when they start to organize, the liquid starts to organize into a solid matrix. Um, it forms hexagonal rings with those water molecules. And you still have the uh, uh, hydrogen bonding interacting. But when they form the rings, instead of molecules being close to one another like that, then they form these rings. Right? And you got all that empty space in there. So what they do is they sort of balloon out a little bit, add volume when it turns from a liquid to a solid for water. And that's why water, that's why ice floats. It's less dense than liquid water. And it's a good thing too. What would happen if, if uh, water followed the norm for the other materials. Once ice froze, what would it do? Sink to the bottom and be insulated. I mean, it would stay, stay ice, mostly. So then the top layer would freeze again. Pretty soon, your lakes and oceans would all be one solid block of ice. Like, <laughs> that will never do. That would be disastrous. <clears throat> anyway. So these dipole-dipole forces are responsible for some of the interactions, and they explain um, the strong attractions 
the high melting points and the high boiling points for some substances, you can trace that to uh, dipole dipole interactions. Now, I mentioned earlier, let's see, next slide hydrogen bonding, of course, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. We've this is in black and white, we've already talked about it, so I'm not going to hammer it again. London dispersion forces, we talked about those. As the molecules get bigger, then the probability of redistributing electron density for an instant increases. So larger molecules, larger uh, noble gas atoms um, will increase their melting point, increase their boiling point temperatures um, correspondingly as their size increases. Okay. Simply because you can, the probability of redistributing is, is more, uh, it's more probable. So when you get large molecules, these London dispersion forces become stronger. Uh, for one thing, the probability of redistributing is more, plus you have uh, more room for them to interact. So a case in point, the hydrocarbon series, um, you get this organic chemistry. Go ahead. Right. Anybody going on? Organic? No? Okay. Um, the hydrocarbon series, hydrogen and carbon together. That's it. So we start off with methane, right? And then we go to two carbons, and this is six, and we go to three carbons, and this is eight. And we keep going, and you get longer and longer and longer molecules. Well, they're all nonpolar. Right? So the only thing that can hold them together is the London dispersion forces. So as you get bigger and you get down here to uh, uh, octane, let's see, just 9 18, uh, and you get on down to uh, bigger molecules like uh, these that you find in uh, diesel, uh, diesel fuel. Um, let's see, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you, these long molecules, the melting point or the boiling point both goes goes up as you move down and the molecules get bigger. So that's another series that can explain and demonstrate the London dispersion forces. Okay. Mm -hmm. In general, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the melting points and the higher the boiling points. Okay, that's one trend. Um, and we see uh, this slide focuses, let's focus on period two. So here's period two right here. And here's the boiling points for those. Boiling point of methane is, is very low. Okay. The boiling point of um, water, right? Sulfur, selenium, tellurium. Sulfur, selenium, tellurium. Oh. So this family, these hydrides of this family, water, uh, hydrogen sulfide, um, hydrogen selenide, hydrogen telluride, there, you can consider them in a family of hydrides. And what we would normally expect is for the boiling point as the molecule gets smaller, the boiling point should go down, right here, go down, down. It does there, it does there, it does there. But when you get down to here, this is where water should be. The problem is, at this point, we're into hydrogen bonding, which is very strong. So this one is not there, it's up here. Okay. But if we focus on the second period alone, and instead of going up and down, we go side to side. Then we go uh, carbon, and then next door to carbon is nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Right, carbon, nitrogen. This one should be down here, and that one should be up there if the trend were. But the problem is um, hydrogen bonding for water is much stronger than it is for hydrogen fluoride. That's primarily due to the fact that oxygen carries the two negative charges. Um, and we'll have to, let's see. 
Did we talk about formal charge? We didn't talk about formal charge. We did talk about readout, so yeah. So oxidation state of oxygen is minus two, and hydrogen is plus one, but the oxidation state of fluorine is minus one. So there's a difference in the size of the oxidation state, the potential charge, although it's not a full charge. Don't get me wrong there. Um, and what we've got is uh, a much greater interaction here between these molecules than you get between those. So that, that flips those two. Okay, which is capable of forming stronger intermolecular forces, nitrogen or water? Should be instant, water. Hydrogen bonding versus a nonpolar molecule. What does the monopolar molecule have available to it for bonding? London dispersion forces. Okay. So water has the stronger bonding. And there's your explanation. You can have the same formula, a right? molecular formula for a molecule, C2H6O. But the structure makes all the difference in determining the boiling point and melting point. Right? The one on the left, it's the same formula. The one on the left is ethanol, you know, the drinking kind, booze. And the one on the right is dimethyl ether. Right? The balance here. Since there's no hydrogen attached to that oxygen, there's no potential for hydrogen bonding. And even if there was, right, uh, these, these bonds are slightly polar toward the oxygen, but they balance one another because they're symmetric. Well, they're not exactly symmetrical, right? If we look at the Lewis dot structure, what is that going to tell you is the electronic structure around the oxygen? Geometry. It's tetrahedral, right? You've got a group here, a group here, lone pair there, and lone pair there. Four groups around the central atom is tetrahedral, right? Remember VSEPR? Vaguely. <laughs> okay. But here's the problem. Um, whereas uh, these lone pairs would tend to compress, compress these two down, right, and make it a bent molecule. What you have is steric interference. These big hydrogen, these hydrogen sticking out here, keep it from bending too far. So while it doesn't totally uh, cancel out the polarity of, of the bonds around the oxygen, um, it does uh, hinder the bending so that you get a, a net uh, polar molecule. It's slightly polar. And then you have these long pairs, of course, they stand out there and those are negatives uh, without any argument but there's steric interference also around the oxygen because of these big uh, methyl groups sticking out there so they can't the positives can't get close to the negative right there's there's interference right <clears throat> so what this means is the Boiling point and melting point for this is much, much higher than this one because of the availability of hydrogen bonding for this one and almost uh, no polarity for that molecule. There's some, but not much. How about this one? Which of these gases behaves more ideally? Carbon monoxide. Let's see, I think it's like this or dinitrogen. Oops, sorry. Of course I have it. What do we mean by ideal behavior? Ideal behavior in a gas um, is like I was describing earlier, those billiard balls, right? The molecules should behave as if they're solid objects and they hit, they bounce off, they don't interact at all. So the ideal behavior is non-interaction or low interaction. Non-ideal behavior is some interaction when the molecules approach one another. 
So that means there needs to be some way to uh, produce an electrostatic attraction. Here, this is a nonpolar molecule. So what does it have available to it? London dispersion forces only. Very, very weak. Whereas this one is slightly polar toward the oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Remember? Electronegative negativity trends, lower left, upper right increase. Okay. So left to right, if we go from carbon to oxygen, oxygen's more electronegative than carbon. So we should get a slight uh, dipole here in that molecule. So this is not going to behave as ideally as that. That's the whole point of this slide. <clears throat> and there's the wherefores and the whys at the bottom. Now, this is at the same temperature and pressure. Remember what I said about gases. If you want ideal behavior in just about any gas, you need what? High temperature, low pressure. So why is that? Well, in this context, high temperature means that when they do come together, they've got so much kinetic energy, the, the attractive forces don't matter. I mean, they just slam in each other and then they're gone. Right? So the, in, the attractive forces are insignificant with high temperature. And low pressure means that there's, there are fewer molecules to interact. So you don't see the effect and the, the incidence of uh, collisions is reduced. That's, that's some kind of, okay, let's check them out. Now, my subject predicate agreement. I hear my, my high school teacher's voice in my back of my head. <clears throat> liquids, characteristic of liquids, they're low compressible, right? Just like solids, you can't compress them uh, with, I'll describe an exception. They, they're not rigid. They need their own container to maintain their shape. They have relatively high density compared to gases. Um, I'll talk about surface tension in a minute. I want to talk about compressibility. Uh, liquids have been found to be compressible, but it takes huge pressures. Uh, case in point. Um, ocean going vessels have been interested in decades in the uh, deep oceans. So they send down remote probes and sample at those depths, or they send down sensors that are, are keyed to sense certain things like temperature, salinity, and, and even pressure. Uh, and uh, uh, they can be modified to determine densities. And they find that at, the, at uh, one and a half, two miles down, the density of water is much higher than it is on the surface. So liquids can be compressed. It just takes a lot of pressure. <clears throat> surface tension. This is uh, observed in liquids, especially liquids with high dipole-dipole interactions like water, have high surface tension. Surface tension by definition means that the liquid resists an increase in surface area. Right? So uh, that's why when um, uh, raindrops form, they form sphere, uh, sphere, except where if you could watch them as they fall, wind resistance, you know, friction uh, elongates them. But if a water dropping in a vacuum would be a perfect sphere uh, because that, uh, minimizes the uh, energy expenditure in other shapes. That's the minimum energy is a sphere, perfect sphere. So where does surface tension come from? Uh, it can be traced back to intermolecular forces. If we have a, a container of water, what you have is water molecules that I'm drawing as spheres on the surface, and then you have water molecules underneath them, right? all the way down, all the way down, all the way down, in three dimensions. Okay, so the attractive, the attraction between water molecules 
is distributed evenly around these guys down in here. So if you have this water molecule, it's got one above it and over here and over here and over here, and then one in front, one behind it, then you get a distribution of those attractions uh, evenly in all three dimensions. But at the surface, you've only got attractions in this direction, this direction, that direction, and front and back. And then this direction, there's, there are no neighbors. So you have to distribute the uh, electrostatic attractions, so to speak, for this layer uh, is distributed only in, in the, what, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, in five directions. Right? So the forces that are holding, that are attracting these guys together are stronger than they are down here because they have no neighbors above them. So <clears throat> what's the practical effect? You can observe it, right? I did this as a kid. First time I heard about this, I said, ah, I don't believe that. So I took a, a needle, got my mother's sewing kit, a small needle, and I got a pan of water, let it settle down. It needs to be smooth because uh, any extra forces will disrupt. So once it's smooth, then I got the needle and it got close, close as I could get, just barely touched the water and turned it loose. The needle sat there right on the surface, held by surface tension. And then later, when I was working on a bachelor's degree in biology, field trips, one of my courses went on a field trip, and uh, we're, uh, this is sort of an ecological investigation. We were looking at uh, insects that were in the environment. And there was one in particular that, uh, you know how when a stream is flowing, it's flowing pretty fast and its, its surface is disrupted. But when it hits a, a rock or something sticking out in there, it goes in and it swirls around in an eddy behind the rock. Right? And it's calm back there. I mean, swirl some, but it's relatively calm. You see these insects with uh, six legs, of course, and they'd be on the surface of the water and they're just skimming across the water. And their, their legs, they're spread way apart. I mean, they, they distributed their weight over a wide area. And they were, they were called water skimmers. Right? You may have seen them yourself sometimes. On ponds, right, that are calm, they work pretty well. And then occasionally a fish will come up, <laughs> they're gone. Or other insects, right? Uh, dragonfly larvae. Have you ever seen a dragonfly larvae? Boy, they're mean. I mean, blow them up to large size and you can make a sci fi movie out of them. They are nasty looking creatures, voracious appetites. <clears throat> but these water skimmers were using surface tension to stay on top of the water. Okay. Um, capillary action is another effect that we can observe from these um, intermolecular forces. And actually, in this case, the intermolecular forces are uh, competing between the liquid and the tube. Okay, so um, and look at them as either cohesive forces or adhesive. Cohesive forces are those forces that are holding light molecules together. Adhesive forces are the ones that form between the liquid and its surroundings, a container. And if we have a glass tube, draw my thing again. Uh, say, let's use water. If we have a glass tube here that's wide like this, then the water is going to rise about to there. Right, you're not going to see a perceptible difference. But what you notice is at the edges, you get the, the what starts to be a meniscus. Right? In any small tube, you'll see water moving up. It is, it's kind of drawn up on the sides. Well, it's drawn up on the sides because uh, it's attracted to the water, to the glass. Glass is basically silicon dioxide. So it's got these oxygens with their negative uh, potential uh, attracting the positive side of the water molecules, the hydrogens, and it's drawing them up. Right? 
So um, when you have a big tube like that, the forces, these adhesive forces are too weak. They can't, they, there's not enough to pull the, the column of water up. But if we decrease the size of the tube, they're really small, then the, they have less surface area is devoted to cohesive and more surface area to adhesive. And then it's able to, to walk its way up the capillary. And the smaller the capillary, the higher it gets. So if that's a single, it, it'll go up a lot higher. And it'll go up, it'll rise until those uh, adhesive forces are balanced by the, the mass of water below. Okay. So the forces might be similar for small capillaries. Uh, this one is, is bigger around, but the mass of water right here is about the same as it is from here to here uh, because the volume of the cylinder, a tall skinny cylinder has the same volume as a, as a short fat a wide cylinder. So I think I got uh yeah well actually this is <clears throat> uh which is dominant uh when you when you put something into a capillary in our case we talk about water but this is mercury so you notice in in uh you ever seen a mercury barometer before now if you get a chance to look at one they're kind of rare anymore uh it's a long glass tube and it's got a pool of mercury in the bottom and it goes up into the, the tube, and above the mercury in the tube is a vacuum. Okay. So any force from air pushing down on the outside of the pool of mercury forces the mercury up into the glass tube. Well, mercury is has very, very strong uh, cohesive forces among the atoms and very weak attraction to the glass surface. Right? So its meniscus is like that, rather than like this. And that's what this slide is supposed to demonstrate. So the cohesive forces in this case are dominant. Whereas in the case of the water molecule, where you get these attractions between the water molecules and the uh, surface of the glass, um, you get uh, a concave meniscus. Uh, because of that, the um, adhesive forces dominate in that loca location. Okay, another effect that these um, intermolecular forces have is, is measured and visible in viscosity. So by definition, viscosity is the measure of a, list, a liquid's resistance to flow, and you can measure it in, in numerous ways. If all you want to know is, is it viscous enough or is it, is it too thin, then you, there are certain tests that you can devise, particularly in the food industry, to see if, if your product is coming out right. It's just a, a quick test. Like they'll have, a, they put a drop of stuff on this a smear plate and then they'll grab a squeegee and they go whoosh, and measure how long it goes before it runs out. So uh, viscosity has a bearing there. If you want more precise measurements, then you have uh, um, either you let it drip through a predetermined size hole. How long does it take for a certain volume to have to drop a certain volume? Or you can use a penetrometer if it's very viscous. You know, you just have a pool of it here, and then you have this this thing up here, this prescribed height, and it looks like a, a plumb bob. Right? It's pointed on one end, and they just drop it. And it goes. How deep did it go into the? It's a measure of viscosity. Is calibrated <clears throat> for uh, standard measure. Large intermolecular forces um, contribute to higher viscosity. Also, molecular complexity will uh, influence the uh, viscosity. So, uh, if you have molecules that are very long and they can entangle, that can increase the viscosity. So that, that sort of biases our understanding of the intermolecular forces. Those forces are more like uh, uh, tying a knot. 
So if you if you take um, starch, which is a very long molecule, and uh, uh, put it in water, it'll thicken up. It'll thicken your recipe by putting starch in it. <clears throat> uh, two things are acting there, the intermolecular forces and the entanglement. So I mentioned these earlier, amorphous solids, um, they have a disordered structure, but they're still solids. And uh, glass is a good example. In fact, there's one school of thought that says glass is a super cool liquid. Uh, that seems like nitpicking to me. It looks solid, it is solid. Crystalline solids, though, have an ordered structure. And uh, they can be broken down into the smallest possible unit that repeats over and over and over again, called the unit cell. We'll talk about that. Uh, in fact, this slide we'll talk about. <clears throat> That's the, the smallest three-dimensional repeating unit in a crystal, it's called the unit cell. Now, sometimes the unit cell is, is cubic, and that's, those are the ones we're going to focus on, but that can be other shapes too. And this is a whole uh, massive uh, segment of chemistry studying unit cells and crystalline structures. We can describe the crystalline solid in terms of the unit cell. Or we can describe it in, in terms of this closest packing model. So we're going to look at both of them. And there's some interchange between the two. But it just depends on which one satisfies your um, needs. Uh, how are you investigating the solid as to which one works best? Uh, that can be viewed as two sides of the same coin. Okay, so we're going to look at cubic cells first, the unit cell in the form of a cube. Um, in the top one, <clears throat> we say, here's the unit cell. This is a simple cube. So each of the corners of the cube, eight of them, is occupied by an atom or a molecule. And for simplicity's sake, we're going to focus on, say, just metal atoms. It's simpler to look at it that way, because you can think of them as balls. Um, but in the lattice, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in the lattice, they actually share this crystalline uh, cubic cell with another neighboring cubic cell. So what that means is uh, how much of, the question is how much of the atom at each one of these interactions can you claim for that unit cell, right? Sometimes you can only claim half of it for that cell or maybe a quarter of it, or maybe an only an eighth of it for that cell. Okay. And it's useful to view those, uh, the cubic structures in terms of space filling models. For this simple cube, actually, what you have is um, these atoms at the corners are touching one another. Another possibility is you've got the cube Plus, you've got one in the middle. It's called a body centered cube. And in that case, the, the atom in the middle is pushing on these on the outside so they don't touch anymore. Okay. The other possibility for cubic cells is the face centered cube. And this is the most common. The face centered cube says you have an atom in the face of your cube on, on each of the faces. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six atoms in the face of your cube and an atom at each corner. So this is what the space filling would look like. So here are your corner atoms. Here's your uh, face atoms. And notice that the face atoms, they contribute only half an atom to that cube. Uh, the slicing. Okay. I got a video that should help. Uh, and these guys, You've only got an eighth of one of those contributing to that particular cube. And the other seven eighths go to the neighbors. Okay, so 
Let's see. Come on. There we go. So here I got a video. Now what um you already know this, but what I will do is because this is a, a recording of a recording, the quality is going to be bad if I leave it like that for the Zoom video. So what I do is I go in to these uh, embedded videos and I replace them with the original. They look a whole lot better. So when you go back and view the, the posted video, you'll see the original. It'll probably look better than that. So let's start the video. If you could travel within a crystalline solid, you would see the particles, atoms, ions, or molecules arranged in a regular array. Here, the spaces are greatly exaggerated, but in reality, the particles are packed close together. The unit cell of a crystal structure is the smallest portion that defines the structure. Stacking unit cells next to each other in all three directions gives the structure. Many elements and simple compounds have unit cells from the cubic crystal system. Let's examine the three types of cubic unit cells. All cubic unit cells have particles at the corners of a cube. The simple or primitive cubic unit cell has particles at the corners only. In reality, the particles lie as close to each other as possible. Note that the particles touch along the cube edges, but not along a diagonal in the face or along a diagonal through the body. By slicing away parts that belong to neighboring unit cells, we see that the actual unit cell consists of portions of the particles. When the cells pack next to each other, in all three dimensions, we obtain the crystal. If we fade the others out, you can see the original group of eight particles within the array and the unit cell within that group. We find the number of particles in one unit cell by combining all the particles portions. In the simple cubic unit cell, eight corners, each of which is one-eighth of a particle, combine to give one particle. A key feature of a crystal structure is its coordination number the number of the nearest neighbors surrounding each particle. In a simple cubic array, any given particle has a neighboring particle above, below, to the right, to the left, in front, and in back of it for a total of six nearest neighbors. The body-centered cubic unit cell has a particle at each corner and one in the center, which is colored pink to make it easier to see. With full-size spheres, you can see that the particles don't touch along the edges of the cube, but each corner particle does touch the one in the center. The actual unit cell consists of portions of the corner particles and the whole one in the center. Eight-eighths give one particle, and the one in the center gives another for a total of two particles. In this tiny portion of a body-centered cubic array, you can see that any given particle has four nearest neighbors above and four below for a total of eight nearest neighbors. The face-centered cubic unit cell has a particle at each corner and in each face, which are colored yellow here, but none in the center. The corner particles don't touch each other but each corner does touch a particle in the face, and those in the faces touch each other as well. The actual unit cell consists of portions of particles at the corners and in the faces. Eight-eighths at the corners gives one particle, and half a particle in each of six faces gives three more, for a total of four particles. In this tiny portion of a face-centered cubic array, notice that a given particle has four nearest neighbors around it, four more above and four more below for a total of 12 nearest neighbors. Stacking spheres shows how the three cubic unit cells arise. Arrange a layer of spheres in horizontal and vertical rows. Note the large diamond-shaped space among the particles. Placing the next layer directly over the first gives a structure based on the simple cubic unit cell. Those larger spaces mean an inefficient use of space, 
In fact, only 52% of the available volume is actually occupied by spheres. Because of this inefficiency, the simple cubic unit cell is seen rarely in nature. A more efficient stacking occurs if we place the second layer over the spaces formed by the first layer, and the third layer over the spaces formed by the second. That simple change leads to 68% of the available volume occupied by the spheres and a structure based on the body-centered cubic unit cell. Many metals, including all the alkali metals, adopt this arrangement. For the most efficient stacking, shift every other row in the first layer so the large diamond-shaped spaces become smaller triangular spaces and place the second layer over them. Then, the third layer goes over the holes visible through the first and second layers. In this arrangement, called cubic closest packing, spheres occupy 74% of the volume. Note that it is based on the face-centered cubic unit cell. Many elements, covalent compounds, and, as you'll see in the next two examples, ionic compounds adopt cubic closest packing. Sodium chloride adopts the sodium chloride, or rock salt, structure, as do many other alkali, halides, alkaline earth oxides and sulfides, and other ionic compounds. Picture separate face-centered cubic arrays of chloride ions and sodium ions as they approach and interpenetrate each other. The smaller sodium ions fit in the holes between the larger chloride ions and the NaCl unit cell. Zinc sulfide adopts the zinc blend structure, as do the copper-1 halides and several other compounds. If face-centered cubic arrays of zinc ions and sulfide ions approach and interpenetrate slightly offset from each other, each ion becomes surrounded tetrahedrally by four of the other ions. Note the blinking zinc ion and the four sulfides. You can see the relative positions in this slightly expanded view of the zinc blend unit cell. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the closest packing model in just a minute. And I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess we have time. Uh, I got another video that you have to, you have to tune your ear to the Indian accent. So it's like head. <clears throat> but, um, at this point, I want to digress a little bit and talk about how do we determine the actual distance between layers in a crystal. When you stack them in there, um, there is a way using this equation and proper methods to tell just how far apart those layers are stacked from one another. <clears throat> we use the Bragg equation. In the Bragg equation, um, we usually use x-rays, right? So that wavelength is going to be very, very short, high energy x-rays. Uh, the n is an integer, and it's related to the harmonic. Do you know uh, harmonics in sound? Anybody play a wind instrument? Okay, so you know that you have the fundamental, and then if you blow a little harder, you can get the, the next harmonic with the same fingering. Or, well, I don't know, with... You play a clarinet or... Uh, okay, so you... The next, the next octave up, you have to use different fingering because of the nature of the, of the, the tube. It's a straight tube, whereas I, I played the saxophone, and it's a conical tube, so you could use the same fingering for the next harmonic. That was the, one of the advantages of the saxophone and the clarinet, although I love the sound of the clarinet. You don't have to use vibrato in a clarinet. I mean, the, the sound is so full, you don't have to uh, play with it at all. But with the saxophone, Sometimes you have to use vibrato to make it sound good. Anyway, <clears throat> so this refers to the whether it's the fundamental or number one, or it's the second harmonic, number two. And then that's equal to um, just the number two. And this is D, the distance between the layers. So that's what we're getting at. That's what we want to find out. 
And then you need to know theta. Theta is the angle of incidence and reflection. Now, it, it varies a little bit for, uh, its usage varies a little bit for the, uh, the crystal structure itself, but um, if, you've, uh, if you've never had physics and you've never studied optics, then this is a little tutorial. So if you have a mirror right, up there and light's coming in, right, when you use a, a ray trace for the light, comes in and it bounces off that mirror, right? The law of reflection says that there's the normal, the right angle to the surface, then this angle is exactly the same as that angle. So that's the angle of reflection. With crystals, what you've got is you've got layers of mirrors. <laughs> so you got this layer here, you got this layer down here, and I separated for a reason. As the light comes in, it can reflect off this surface and it can reflect off of this surface, like that. So now you've got um, two beams coming out and if they're represented by waves, then we have to introduce another topic called uh, interference. Constructive or destructive interference. Constructive interference says if these waves are in step, right, like that, that then the addition of those two will be uh, a stronger wave, and you can detect that difference uh, as you as you rotate your source and your uh, detector through these angles. You can pick up the strength. And when you hit a peak, the first peak will be at the first at the fundamental. The second peak, which will be less strength, will be at the second fundamental. And they'll be at different angles. Uh, I used to do this with, um, uh, I was, my PhD is in soil science. So we would uh, isolate the clays, so it's the very smallest particles of the soil. And uh, how we did it is, it takes too long for this course. Anyway, once we got the uh, clays isolated in, in the, an aqueous suspension, we would just take a drop and put it on a slide, glass slide. And as it dried, the plates would, would settle and they would lay flat. So when you, when you uh, bang them with x-rays, they would go into the crystal, the clay crystal, bounce off, and you could detect and determine what's the distance between the layers. Right? You just, you know this value, you know that value, uh, the first one you come to is one, and then you solve for the unknown, which is the distance between them. And we could tell what type of clay it was by the, the distance between the crystal layers. But you can do that with any crystal. <clears throat> uh, and there's, a, there's an example. So the, the thetas, um, actually this theta is, is the important one right here because that's the angle of reflection, angle of incidence and angle of reflection because it's uh, against the normal to the surface. Anyway, those reflected rays will either um, destructively or constructively interfere with one another. And you can, you can trace through angles and your detector will give you a peak. And at that peak, you know the angle and then you plug it in your formula. You can also do this in three dimensions, right? And with a little more difficulty and, and uh, expertise and experience, you can take the, um, the spot pattern that comes out of X-rays through your crystal and uh, determine the crystal structure through which the waves pass. Um, this is the way that uh, the DNA molecule was, the structure was determined. The real trick was, how do you get DNA into a crystal structure? Once you did that, then the real work started. You get the, the X-ray crystallography, and then you have to interpret that crystallography in terms of, you know, what was the origin? 
and that's Watson Crick and see one of the guy got the Nobel Prize in biology for that one one year. Although, um, she, I can't remember the woman's name. There was a woman that did much of the legwork, and they and she would have gotten uh, partial credit also. But the Nobel committees um, don't nominate, don't accept nominations for Nobel Prize for people who are dead or dead. And she passed away before the nominations came through. She was pretty young. She was in her forties. Rosalind, I can't remember her last name. She had like cancer. Yeah, she had ovarian cancer. Yeah. She had, she had some people working for her too that, that did a lot of like work. So, you know, where do you stop? I mean, you can't have, I guess you could, you know, two dozen people accepting the prize, <laughs> but it is a collaborative effort. Okay, so these crystalline solids. <coughs> Can be formed from different uh, sources, right? You can form them, and, and it was mentioned in that uh, video that you could make uh, uh, unit cells out of ionic solids. So some of the, the particles would be positive charged, some would be negative charged. The zinc blend model was the one that was used. So they could be ionic solids, um, and the um, the macroscopic appearance of the crystal is based upon its uh, microscopic structure. So if, if I were a geologist and interested in, in uh, crystal structures in rocks, then I would be able to recognize certain types of, of like the cubic crystal for sodium chloride or uh, calcite, um, calcium chloride is uh, a rhomboid, but right? it's just, and that's due to its uh, this crystal structure that makes it do that. Molecular solids. So those form from um, discrete molecules like water. So water is going to form that hexagonal structure. That's why snowflakes are six sided. And um, then you have atomic solids also. And that was mentioned in terms of, of the way metals form. and. Uh, what they say, the alkaline metals, the, the ones in the first, uh, tend to form the simple cubic model. Most of them don't, but those guys do. Simply because there's a lot of wasted space. Well, this is 52% is only occupied by the atoms and the rest is waste. Okay, so here we have some examples. Um, the chart on the next slide uh, puts them into a matrix of what type they are. But you've got the possibility here for for a diamond. Uh, here's the, the the ionic solid, and here's the uh, molecular solid. Uh, I thought it was interesting. The the diamond, every carbon atom in the diamond is covalently bonded. So theoretically, if you had a, a, a cut diamond, it had no flaws in it whatsoever, shrink down to the size of an atom. You could hop from atom to atom, walking across their bonds, and uh, go from one side to the other. It's like a single molecule. Of course, my wife's diamond has a flaw in it, so we put it under the post. Let's see. Oh, uh, this is a covalent solid, ionic solid, and a molecular solid. The forces holding this solid together, the last one are hydrogen bonding. Okay, there we have, um, uh, we can also classify them as atomic solids, right? So the network atomic solid is, is an example is the diamond. Uh, let's see. Ooh, I thought there was more to that. No, there's not. Let's be on a different slide. Um, ionic solids, right, are sodium chloride salt, and our molecular solids are the uh, uh, ice. 
That came straight out of your book, so you, you can find that. Maybe there's more discussion in the book than there is here. Okay, so we've talked about the unit cell. Now we want to look at the uh, closest packing model. It's another way to look at how, in fact, that first uh, video incorporated aspects of closest packing and the uh, unit cell in the discussion and draws and drew them together somehow. Remember how um, the simple cubic cell has this uh, this array of spheres this way, this way, and they're, they're lockstep, they're in line. And then you put that layer in line with the one below it. That would, that would obviously give you a simple cubic unit cell. So that packing model is not the closest packing model because the closest packing is you got to shift it so that you can drop down into some of those gaps. Oops, wrong direction. Okay, so here's the Indian lady that's going to talk. The three dimensional modes of packing can be easily understood by dividing the whole process into three steps. Close packing of spheres in one dimension. In one dimension, close packing. There is just one way of arranging the spheres. Here, the spheres are arranged in a row, touching one another. As a result, each sphere is in contact with two neighboring spheres. Thus, in one-dimensional close packing, the coordination number is 2. Close packing of spheres in two dimension. Close packing structures in two dimension can be generated by stacking rows of one dimensionally closed pack spheres one above the other. This can be done in two ways square close packing and hexagonal close packing. Square close packing. In this type of packing, the second row of spheres is placed in contact with first row in such a way that the spheres of the second row are placed exactly above the spheres of first row. In such an arrangement, the spheres are aligned horizontally and vertically such that each sphere is in contact with four other spheres. So, the coordination number is 4. If we call the first row as A type row, the second row being exactly same as the first row, so it is also called as A type. If we keep on placing such similar rows one above the other, then such an arrangement is known as AAA type of arrangement or square packing. Hexagonal close packing. In this type of packing of spheres, the second row of spheres is placed in a staggered manner such that the spheres fit in the depressions of the first row. If we call the first row as A type, then as the second row is different from the first row, it can be called as B type. Now, if we place a third row above the second row in the similar manner, we will observe that the third row spheres are aligned with those of first layer and each sphere is in contact with six other spheres. So, the coordination number is six. Similarly, on placing the fourth layer, we will observe that the fourth row of spheres are aligned with those of second layer. Hence, this type of arrangement is known as ABAB type of arrangement or hexagonal close packing. If we compare square close packing with hexagonal close packing, we will observe that empty spaces are less in hexagonal close packing than 
compared to square close packing. Now, what are these empty spaces and what role do they play in packing efficiency? The empty spaces in between the spheres are known as voids. These voids are responsible for decrease in packing efficiency of the solid crystal. More the number of voids, less is the packing efficiency of the crystal. Now, you must be wondering what is meant by packing efficiency. We have discussed about this in later part of the section. Now let us study about close packing in three dimension. Three dimensional close packing from two dimensional square close packed layers. This type of packing is obtained by placing two dimensional square closed packed layer above the first one such that the spheres of the second layer are exactly above the spheres of the first layer. In this arrangement, the spheres of both the layers are perfectly aligned horizontally and vertically. On arranging layers one after the other in this pattern, we will observe that each sphere is in contact with six other spheres. Four from the same layer, one from the layer above and one from the layer below that sphere. So the coordination number is 6. If we call the first layer as A type and since all the layers are also of the same type, this kind of arrangement is known as AAA type of arrangement. On observing carefully, we will find that this arrangement has generated a simple cubic lattice and its unit cell is primitive cubic unit cell. Dimensional close packing from two dimensional hexagonal closed pack layers. The three dimensional hexagonal closed pack structure can be obtained by placing two dimensional hexagonal structures one layer above the other. Placing second layer over the first layer. Let us take a two dimensional hexagonal closed packed layer A. Notice this layer has triangular voids. Place a similar closed packed layer in such a way that the spheres of the second layer are placed in depressions of the first layer. As the spheres of the second layer are aligned differently as compared to the first layer, so let us call this layer as B type. On observing, we will notice that not all the triangular voids of the first layer are covered by the spheres of the second layer. This gives rise to a different arrangement and different voids. Voids. There are two types of voids. Tetrahedron voids, denoted by T. Octahedron voids, denoted by O. Let us study how these voids are formed. When we place a closed packed layer above the depressions of the first layer, we will notice that at some places the triangular voids of the first layer are being covered by the spheres of second layer. At such places, a type of void is formed. This type of void is known as tetrahedral void, T, since a tetrahedron is formed by joining the centers of the four surrounding spheres. While at other places, we will notice that the triangular voids of the first layer coincides with the triangular voids of the second layer such that their triangular shapes do not overlap 
at such places, another type of void is formed. This type of void is known as octahedral void. O. Since an octahedron is formed by joining the centers of the six surrounding spheres. Now, in case we need to calculate the number of tetrahedral and octahedral voids in a crystal structure, then just knowing the number of spheres will serve the purpose. Suppose there are n spheres in the crystal structure, then the number of octahedral voids generated is equal to n. The number of tetrahedral voids generated is equal to 2n. Placing third layer over second layer. Now let us place third layer over second layer. Stacking of third layer over second layer can be done in two ways. First, by covering tetrahedral voids. Second, by covering octahedral voids. By covering tetrahedral voids. The tetrahedral voids of the second layer can be covered by placing the spheres of the third layer over them. On doing so, the spheres of the third layer will get exactly aligned with the spheres of the first layer. So, if we can call the first layer as A type and the second layer as B type, then the third layer will also be A type. As the pattern of spheres is repeated alternately in other layers, so this pattern is known as ABAB pattern and the structure formed is known as hexagonal close packed HCP structure. In this type of structure, each sphere is in contact with 12 other spheres. 6 from the same layer, 3 from the bottom layer and 3 from the top layer. So the coordination number is 12. Covering octahedral voids. The octahedral voids of the second layer can be covered by placing the spheres of the third layer over them. On doing so, the spheres of the third layer are not aligned with the spheres of either first layer or second layer. So, if we call the first layer as A type and the second layer as B type, then this third layer will be C type. Now, if we place the fourth layer over the octahedral voids of the third layer, then the sphere gets aligned with the spheres of the first layer. Thus, this pattern is known as ABC ABC type, and the structure formed is known as cubic close packed CCP or face centered cubic. FCC structure. In this type of structure, each sphere is in contact with 12 other spheres. 6 from the same layer, 3 from the bottom layer and 3 from the top layer. So, the coordination number is 12. That's very fun. <coughs> But I, I, hope, I hope you started to see some sort of a pattern developing here. Um, so let's uh, focus our attention on metals so that we can treat them as in as discrete spheres that go into this arrangement. The ABAB type packing was discussed first. And that just means that the, the first layer and the third layer are exactly alike. Or the second layer and the fourth layer are exactly alike in their positions. 
And this is identified as hexagonal close pack unit cell, hexagonal unit cell. In this type, the ABCA, we've, um, we've got three identifiable layers, A, B, and C, A, B, and C. And this one is identified as cubic close packing or, which is kind of odd to me because, well, I guess it shouldn't be strange because you can look at the unit cells and we'll do that in the next slide. You can look at the unit cells, they're um, cubic in shape, but they also have uh, a face centered unit cell format. So if we look at the hexagonal closest packing, the ABA example, and we start slicing through them, um, then what I see here is the hexagonal closest packing, the unit cell comes out as a face-centered cube. Now, if we go back, go back to this one, this is hexagonal unit cell. Well, my question is, if it's hexagonal unit cell, why is it cubic? So I've never had that adequately explained to me. So you're not alone if it's, if it's confusing you also. The uh, cubic closest packing, the one that's named cubic closest packing, also gives you a face centered cube. And um, It's identified not as not only as cubic closest packing, but as face centered cubic. I'm thinking that this hexagonal closest packing, this is not the only way that you can you can see it come out. It depends on what these spheres are made of as to whether it's it looks like this. I think they've simplified it a lot. And this is one possibility. I think there are other possibilities that can come out of this closest packing model. All right, there was mention of the coordination number. Coordination number can mean one thing in, in one branch of chemistry and, and one thing in another branch of chemistry. And in fact, um, the, the Indian lady was referencing coordination number in two dimensions for a while and then shifted to three dimensions. So it depends on your, um, your uh, frame of reference as to whether it's 12 or something else, I think at one time. Uh, in two dimensions, it's six, right? You got six closest neighbors here, but in three dimensions, you have 12 closest neighbors. And the previous uh, video also mentioned coordination numbers. That just re references um, what are their closest neighbors? How many of their closest neighbors are, are they touching? Coordination number can also be used in uh, uh, waters of hydration. So when you, when you talk about, um, so zinc sulfate and uh, no, it's copper sulfate. Copper sulfate that we used in the first one of the first labs, and we had we determined that there were five waters of association with each copper sulfate. The coordination number of, of water for copper sulfate is five. Or when you put copper sulfate in solution. The copper and the sulfate separate, and the copper is hydrated by so many water molecules. I don't remember how many it is. But that, that's also, you can reference as coordination number. <clears throat> so it, it depends on your frame of reference as to what coordination number means. Okay. Um, the first slide mentioned uh, how many atoms are associated with each unit cell. And that calculation was done for us. So we know that the simple cubic, well, the simple cubic, um, well, I don't have a slide on that. But if you, if you look at your cube like this, and it's got an atom at each corner, right? And it's got eight neighbors. Right? So one eighth of that atom is assigned to this cube and eight times eight eighths is one. So this one is, uh, um, 
one atom per cell. If we have a body centered, right, if we put one in the middle, then that's two atoms per cell. Right? This is just for memory purpose. For the uh, face centered cube, you've still got the, the one from the corners, but you've got a half or six. You got six halves for the face uh, atoms. So that's three more. So that one would be four. The number of atoms in that unit would be four. Now you're probably wondering, why do I care? <laughs> We're going to work a problem in a minute <laughs> where we need to know that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the first one is one atom, and uh, the face centered cubic is four, and we already did the body centered. Also, we, uh, from time to time, we need to know what's the length on the edge of that unit cell okay. and relate that to the diameter of the atoms that are packed. So the length of the edge of a simple cube is just two times R because all the corner atoms are touching. Okay. So two times R would be the diameter of one of them. Okay. All right. That's the easy one. When we get a body centered cube, well, we're doing face centered first. Okay, so face centered cubic. Um, the length of the edge is the radius of the atom times the square root of eight. Yeah, we, we don't have time. Actually, we should have time, but we don't. To look at the geometry, how we determine that. And I, I think, in fact, in the bright space, I've got some supplemental materials if you're interested. You can read those and find out how geometrically we can arrive at that answer. I don't know if your textbook has any discussion of that. But square root of eight times R for a face centered cubic structure will give you the length of the edge. Now, why is that important? If we know the length of the edge, we could, we could say something about the volume of the cubes of that cubic unit. Right? Just, just uh, cube the length of the edge and you get the volume. If you have a body centered cubic, it's a little more complicated. The length of the edge is four divided by the square root of three times r. Okay. That gives you the edge length of the unit cell, and from that we can infer the, we can calculate the volume of the cell. Now, Here's one usage of it. If we have a silver metal crystal that has a uh, the cubic close packing structure and the unit cell is a face centered cubic unit and the edge is 409 picometers, how do we know the edge? We probably got it from Bragg's equation. Right? The distance between the, the layers will inform us on the length of the edge. So 409 picometers. So this is 409 picometers, okay? And we have a structure that is face-centered cubic. Right, so you've got, you got a silver atom at each one of these eight corners, and then you have one on each of the faces. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, you know, overlap that one. Okay, so we wanna calculate the density of the silver metal. First of all, what's a picometer? <laughs> Pico is a prefix, and it's a, a fraction of a meter, a very small fraction. Pico means 10 to the minus 12. So the length of that edge, if we're going to calculate volume, it would be uh, 409 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. Okay, so now that we know the edge, we can calculate the volume. And if we're going to calculate the density, remember, we got the volume. So how many atoms are in that one? Right? Face centered cubic should be four, right? Four atoms per unit cell. 
So four atoms of silver for that volume. So we can take four atoms of silver and determine the mass of that many atoms. That should be a dimensional analysis problem. Okay. So that's what this calculation is going to do. Right, four silver atoms per unit cell. So we would write out um, four atoms per cell per cell. Okay. <clears throat> uh, we would need to vote know the volume first. I'll say, okay, so this is going to give us the mass, and then we would need the volume. So we need uh, 4.09 times uh, 10 to the minus 10th meters. I just moved the decimal place, used up some of this. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, oh, well, in this case, we squared the picometers first, uh, cubed the picometers first, and then we converted it. So we found that the, the equivalent uh, volume is this many cubic centimeters. Uh, by convention, the density of solids is given in grams per cubic centimeter. If we were doing a liquid, we'd do grams per milliliter, which means what? You just change the units because cubic centimeter and a milliliter are exactly the same. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> so we determine the volume to be this. Okay? That goes in the denominator, and now we need to determine the. Uh, well, we're going to do the density. We're going to we're going to plug the volume in, but we're also going to calculate the mass. And, and while we go four atoms, and there's the molar mass, right? but we need to know how many atoms. How many grams per atom to cancel the atoms? So that's where Avogadro's number comes in right here. So that cancels the atoms, and this cancels the moles. It leaves us with grams, and then grams divided by the volume gives us 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter. And that's really, really close to the actual measure density of silver. Okay, so if we continue talking about metals, um, there are a couple of models that have been proposed about uh, how the metals associate one with another. Right? How do you get these forces attracting the metals together? The first one that was proposed, well, the first one that took was the electron C model. It just takes all your valence electrons uh, from the metals and they just, they just kind of they share all over the place. So it's like, like plum pudding. Remember the, the model that uh, uh, Rutherford smashed with his, with his uh, gold foil experiment. And uh, this one was interesting, but it didn't, it didn't give you much information. It didn't solve problems. All right, so there's what it would look like for for different metals, the electron C model. It didn't tell you anything about the energies involved. So the molecular orbital model does. Remember the molecular orbital from the first semester? You guys got that in, in first semester? Yeah. Yeah, where you, where you drew, for instance, if we had uh, hydrogen over here and this hydrogen over here, and they're gonna bond, right? This one's got uh, a 1s orbital, and this one's got a 1s orbital with an electron in it. And then you go up here right, with your sigma and your sigma star anti bonding orbitals. Yeah. Okay. So then this is the molecular orbital part. These are the atomic orbitals here. And once you form the molecular orbitals, those go away. When you form the molecule, now the molecular orbitals dominate, and that, <clears throat> and then you put your uh, electrons in here, right, from bottom to top in energy. Right, this this is your energy scale. 
So that's why uh, dihydrogen forms, because you have a, uh, a uh, fully occupied bonding orbital and no none in the antibody. So your, your bond order would be right, two divided by two to one. So you have a bond order of one or a single bond. Okay, so that's the molecular orbital was also expanded to include metals. <clears throat> um, and in the molecular orbital model, of course, uh, everything in the in the, the group, uh, in the molecule or in the sample of metal, all those atoms contribute their electrons uh, plus their atomic orbitals to reconstruct a molecular orbital model for the entire group. Okay, so the atomic orbitals go away. Now you have molecular orbitals that are common to the entire mass. <clears throat> and when you only have two atoms interacting, right, they, their energies are pretty far apart. But as you get more and more and more of them, their energies come really close together. So you can move, the electrons can move freely, almost freely, from one level to the next. That's why metals are very good conductors of electricity. It didn't take much energy to move them from one to the next. So who knows where the next one is, right? It's probably your neighbor. So you just jump, 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 jump. jump. If there's a push from this side, you're going to feel it on that side. If there's a voltage, an electric push on this side, you feel it all the way through to the other side for a conductor. Uh, for diamond, it wouldn't be that way because the electrons are in the network solid and they're covalently bound, right? so they can't move. Right? You can't do the same thing with, with a diamond as you can with metal. That's why when you take take a diamond to uh, take a stone to the jeweler and you claim it's a diamond, they're going to put this device on it. It measures conductivity, uh, thermal conductivity, right? It won't transmit heat and it measures thermal conductivity to be very, very low. And the lowest is for diamond. Um, if you have a fake, like a zircon, then it'll have a much higher conductivity. Did I tell you guys the story about my wife's blue, blue diamond? A friend of hers uh, wanted to give her a gift. And they said it was a tanzanite. A tanzanite's a beautiful blue stone from Tanzania. <clears throat> and uh, all we had to do was pay shipping. So sure, pay $20, send her the stone, mount it in a ring. Uh, well, we took it to the jeweler to show it off. and. The first person to look at it says, what a beautiful blue diamond. What? Because it was pretty good size. So that's, a, that's a blue diamond. Says, no, it's supposed to be a tanzanite. So they pulled out their instrument, stuck it on there. <laughs> sure enough, it's a diamond. So we said, we're going to leave this with you. You send it to your specialists and have it appraised and give us a certificate. So we can put it on our, our homeowner's policy because <laughs> that's valuable. And it uh, turns out the friend didn't realize that they had sent us a blue diamond. So we told them, to I keep it. They got more money than God anyway. Okay, so uh, here's another model of um, metal, in this case, uh, magnesium. So when we look at the, um, and in this case, we don't actually have a, um, molecular orbital model, but uh, actually it's the molecular orbital model is superimposed on the atomic model because you've got atomic orbitals here for each one of these, like 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p for magnesium. And what we find is the, the highest molecular orbitals here are filled. And if we drew out for two or more atoms up here, we could, we could draw the molecular orbitals and see that <clears throat> the top molecular orbitals are filled, and then there are empty molecular orbitals just above that, but they're very, very close in energies. 
So in order to get an electron from one of these field orbitals into the empty molecular orbit, it takes just a minute amount of energy and it just jumps up there. And when it's up there, right, it belongs to the whole molecule. It can move anywhere it wants. So if there's a push from one side and it's in, in one of those uh, empty molecular orbitals, it can move over and maybe drop down and then back up and move over. And this is statistic averaging, right? The same electron may not be the one that comes, goes from here to here. But that accounts for the conductivity of metals. Now, when we start talking about metal alloys, it's instructive to think of um, this uh, closest packing model. We have two types of metal alloys that can be formed. You can put two metals together, or you can put a metal and a non-metal, it, it varies. Um, but the, uh, the added component, the added element <clears throat> in the alloy can either go into and substitute for one of the parent atoms, like uh, copper and, and zinc, when we get, we get brass. So most of it is copper, and we put some zinc in there. I think it's zinc. Nickel, excuse me, nickel. Uh, copper and zinc is, is uh, bronze. Uh, copper and nickel is, is brass. So my saxophone's made out of. <clears throat> I, I still own it, by the way. <laughs> I just haven't played it in a while. And uh, the, the nickel atom will fit in where a copper used to be. That's called substitutional alloy. Okay. And it will fit in that crystal lattice, whatever the unit cell is. You can have an interstitial alloy if the substituted atom, if, if the, no, the added material, if the atom is small enough, it'll fit in one of those voids. That's interstitial alloy. That's like steel. Carbon, the carbon we add to iron to make steel fits in one of those voids. And if you have um, anything over about 0.3% carbon is high carbon steel. It's very hard, but it can be brittle. Uh, and then anything below that, usually below 0.1% carbon, is considered low carbon steel. And then you can also make steels where you put other elements in there, like um, chromium. I can put chromium in there. It's, it would be part. It would be a substitutional alloy and an interstitial alloy at the same time. You're making carbon uh, chromium steel, which is stainless steel. You know, originally, uh, the chromium composition was about 35% chromium. So that's a lot. Now they make it with, with less and other added. So I guess to modify the properties. But um, those are your two types of alloys. And there's a models. So you can see the difference between the substitutional and interstitials. And when you put carbon in here like this, in there, carbon's not a metal. And what it does, it tends to lock the crystals into place. That's what makes steel harder than iron. Pure iron. 99.99% iron, you have a chunk of it, you can dig it at with your fingernail, soft. But if you put some carbon in it, um, you can scratch glass. <clears throat> or, uh, whatever the case may be, what it does is it locks the crystal structure in place. It won't let, it, won't let it move. That makes it hard. Uh, here's another case of the difference between structures in this uh, network solid where you have uh, covalent bonds everywhere in a diamond locks it in place in this form of carbon, which is known as an allotrope. Remember that term? Allotropes. There are elements that are in different forms, but they're still the same elements. Right? Diamond is one form, graphite's another carbon, and then there's a whole group called fullerenes. Um, that are like nanotubes, you've heard of those nanotubes, and uh, you've heard of buckyballs, Buckminster fullerenes. There are 60 carbons networked like this, only they're in a, in a ball like that. Um, but in this case, you've got these uh, 
covalent bonds in a, in a network of hexagonal plates like that. And then the plates are attracted to one another by weaker bonds. And these would have to be um, London dispersion forces, right? Because this is not, this is not polar. Right? So those plates will slide past one another really easy. And we used to use um, uh, graphite in a squeeze can with a long tube on it. And we'd uh, open up the cap to our uh, cable traceways on our motorcycles, squirt that stuff down in there, and cap it off again. It was a dry lubricant. The nice thing about dry lubricants like that, because they would slide past one another and, and reduce friction, is that it's not wet. It won't attract dust. Okay, so what's the difference between uh, the filled molecular orbitals and the empty molecular orbitals is the energy difference. So the difference for a diamond is huge between the empties and the filled. So these electrons can't move easily. That's why it takes a lot of heat. It's very non-conductive. Uh, whereas metals uh, are, have, are very good conductors. Of electricity and heat because the orbitals are so close together in the energy. I'm not sure why I stuck this one in here. The, the graphite plates are hexagonal. They are very stable. In other words, the strong the bonding within the plate of graphite is very strong because of this um, uh, pi bonding system. I think we covered that right at the end of maybe the last chapter where we had uh, benzene, for instance, and the, the unused P orbitals would overlap. And if the conditions were right, you could form an overlap ring above and below in that structure, and that would give you aromatics. We dig into that in more detail in organic chemistry. Ceramics. All right. Ceramics, for the most part, are operationally defined. In other words, a ceramic is what you'd say it is. But these are basic characteristics of ceramics. They're, they're very strong materials, but they're brittle. Uh, and they can, they can range in densities all, all over the place. You can have a ceramic bowl. Like my, my dogs have a bowl about that big around. It's pretty heavy, made out of uh, fired clay. Stoneware, I guess you'd call it. And then you can have ceramics that are very light. You just, you know, pick them up. There's practically nothing there. They use those on uh, to cover the surface of the space shuttle, those ceramic bricks. Um, but they're brittle, right? So if, you're, if your space shuttle is blasting off and a piece of foam flies off the big yellow orange tank, strikes their wing, It'll knock a big hole in it. And then when you try to re enter the atmosphere, you burn up. That happened to Columbia. I see Challenger was the one where the hole burnt through the solid rocket motors into the, into the orange tank and then blew up, take off. And then Columbia tried to re enter the atmosphere with a damaged wing and it burned up. Um, but ceramics are, they're formed by clays. So these clays I was talking about, I was investigating earlier, you get a, a, a purified clay and there are deposits of clays around the earth, scattered around the earth. Some of them are, are better quality than others. And, uh, some of them are used to make china and some are used or are only suitable for stoneware and some um, are only suitable for making bricks, <laughs> right? But when you heat them up, they undergo a reaction which rearranges the crystals and, and uh, structures it such way that the the forces that are holding them together are very strong. So if you just if you just take clay and mix a little hay in it, a little grass, and let it dry out in the sun, you get adobe, right? And you, you can build your house out of it, but you better coat it with something because either you live in a dry climate or you protect it from the rain because the rain's going to come along and wash your house away. So if you fire it in an oven, you change it and you, it goes through a reaction. Uh, I think it's, it's called a pausolonic reaction, which just means that the aluminum silicates in there 
rearrange their structure so now they resist any uh, uh, weathering from the outside. And that's why houses are, are veneered in brick because it's weather resistant and it looks nice. Um, semiconductors. Semiconductors are based upon um, pure silicon. They're based upon one of these metal boys. Remember that, that line that runs down from here that divides the non-metals from the metals? And a few of these elements like silicon and germanium and arsenic and uh, antimony, um, they have a, a metalloid label because under certain conditions they act like metals and in some conditions they act like non-metals. But silicon is, is used because it's plentiful and cheap as the foundation for our semiconductor industry. So once you have the, a pure lattice, a crystal lattice of silicon in, in that uh, device, uh, in fact, uh, if you've ever, you can uh, Google it or YouTube it, and you can see uh, silicon, pure silicon being made, and it comes out of the, out of the uh, oven like uh, one, big, huge crystal. It's big around and about eight feet long. And it takes a lot of money and effort to do it. It has to be perfectly pure. Uh, the impurities can't tolerate impurities. And then you take it and you slice it, right? And that makes those uh, discs that they, uh, that they print uh, your circuits on in layers, they build them up in layers. <clears throat> but it's based upon silicon, and um, the semiconductor industry is just that. It's a conductor, but it's only a semiconductor. It's not a real conductor. It's not an insulator. It, it's a semiconductor, and it's based upon what you dope the silicon with. If you, if you add something to the silicon in that layer, and it becomes part of the structure, it substitutes for some of the silicons, um, and it's um, to the right of silicon like uh, phosphorus or, or arsenic, one of these to the right has one extra um, valence electron, which makes it an N-type semiconductor. It has that extra electron that's free to move. Okay, that's an N-type. If you dump it with something to the left, then it's deficient in electrons compared to silicon, like boron or gallium, something, something like that. Then you have a p-type semiconductor and if you layer these in a certain arrangement you can produce different types of uh, solid state circuits and it all depends on the, the energy difference between the filled and the and the empty uh, what we call conduction bands if it's an n-type then you have this electron that can move up and down yeah, into these uh, with a little effort, right? It's a semiconductor, so the distance between these two is greater than it is for metals, for conductors. Uh, it's a little more problematic when you're talking about the uh, P-types because for convenience, the, those who work in this industry, they talk, uh, talk about them as either electrons or holes, or absent electrons, which basically is positive charge, but it's missing an electron. So they say the holes move. Well, they actually don't. But the electrons move and they leave behind a hole when they occupy this hole down here. Okay. So the hole uh, has been down here and now it's up here, but the electron moved the other way. So that's about as far as I, my expertise goes. Uh, and here's an illustration. Right. So the N types. Right, you have that extra electron from the arsenic. Here, the boron, you're deficient in electron. Okay, ionic solids. One thing about ionic solids is they have extremely high melting points. Now, you can melt salt, but it takes a lot of energy. The ionic bonds are very strong. The and due to the electrostatic forces, because now you're not just partial uh, 
positive and negative charges, your whole ionic charges, right? So sodium ion, chloride ion. <clears throat> Okay, uh, before I do that, um, I thought it was always interesting when we, uh, when you think about how much energy it takes to melt salt. But you can throw salt into water and just within minutes, it's, it's gone. The sodium and chloride ions are just ripped apart. But it's at room temperature. But when you think about it, the forces that are holding those sodium and chloride ions together in the crystal are the same ones that are overcome by melting it or by hydrating it. So the energy expended has to be the same. Okay. It just happens at a different temperature. Okay, so um, the, the strength of the attractive forces between the anions and cations in an ionic solid are dependent on two factors, right? And this goes back to Coulomb's law, right? Coulomb's law says that the, uh, the force, let's see, do I have a slide on that? Coulomb's, yeah, C-O-U, L O M B. It's not in there, is it? Okay, I'm scratching my head. If I can remember. <clears throat> so the uh, the force between the two is there's a uh, I forget I forget the uh, the symbol that's used for Coulomb's constant. Let's just say it's a, let's just say it's a C. That's a proportionality constant. So you don't have to worry about that. The important part is the force between the two is dependent upon what? The charge of the, uh, let's see. I forget my symbols. The charge of the positive ion and the charge of the negative ion. Let's see, let's see. Coulomb's charge for the, these two, proportional to those and Inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two. Okay. So if they're if the charges are bigger, let's see, I forgot to put the positive here. Oh, there's the positive. <clears throat> if the charges are bigger, then the force is stronger. Right? Because the force is proportional to the strength of these, these, these charges. So for uh a magnesium with a two plus charge and an oxygen with a two plus charge, the force ought to be stronger, the attractive force. Also, the distance between them. So if you can get these ions closer together, then the force is, is uh, increased. So as a practical matter, sodium chloride, sodium and chlorine are bigger uh, ions than magnesium and oxygen, and they're also lesser charge. So the force between magnesium and oxygen in its crystal should be much stronger than it is for sodium chloride in their strong, their uh, crystal. And how do we how do we measure that? How much energy does it take to melt them to, to break the bond? You can measure how much energy does it take to pull them apart. Okay, um, oh, that's been discussed before, the types of voids, the holes that, are, that you can see. Uh, if you only have, if you're only in two dimensions and you have these three together, that's a trigonal hole. But if you, if you put another atom on top of a trigonal hole, you, you close it in and now you have a tetrahedral void. Uh, if, on the other hand, the uh, closest packing model, instead of setting one in that hole, it sets uh, three above it, 
and you just cock them off to one side where they'll fit, then you get a different, you get a, a octahedral void. We call it hole here, but it's the same as the void. The octahedral holes are the hexagonal closest packing. There's two types of voids. Okay, what we find is that when we when we look at the the actually the trigonal void is two dimensional and these guys are three dimensional. So I just dawned on me that you know apples and oranges. I think it's more important to focus on these two. The octahedral hole is void is bigger than the tetrahedral void. So that has a bearing on what you can fit into those places. Like for, for instance, steel. And what type of void does it have? The carbon will fit in there. And sometimes you can't you can't form that type of alloy, for instance, because what you want to put in there won't fit. Or maybe it only fits in in the octahedral holes and the tetrahedral holes are too small. So that limits the what you can put in it. Okay, this came straight out of your book. So I'm not gonna uh, hammer on this one any further. Now, um, I'm trying to finish up this chapter as soon as I can, because I'm running out of time. Um, if you put a liquid in a closed vessel, actually, if you put a liquid in an open vessel and it has any volatility at all, I mean, even water, and, and it's open, then eventually uh, it'll be all gone right? because the, the movement of atoms from the liquid to the gas is one way. But if you close it, then you build up a pressure in the headspace. And in the beginning, of course, it's all one way. You're moving from liquid to, to vapor phase. Uh, but eventually you get enough um, atoms or molecules in the vapor phase that they start returning to the liquid phase. And at some point, notice the volume is dropping here, right? Because some of them are up here now. At some point, um, you have a physical equilibrium where you've got condensation is equal to evaporation in rates. At that point, you've reached that uh, physical equilibrium and no more change, macroscopically change, no more occurs. In other words, you don't see the liquid drop anymore. It just stops. And at that point, if you have the device hooked up, you can measure a pressure up here. And the pressure up there depends upon the temperature and the nature of the liquid, right? Some liquids that have very low intermolecular forces will send a lot of their molecules into the vapor phase before uh, there's enough pressure in the head to start pushing them back into the liquid phase. So the weaker the forces that hold the molecules together, the higher their vapor pressure. It's just the opposite. If the forces are strong, then the vapor pressure is low. And this is another way of representing it. The rate of evaporation is constant. The rate of condensation increases until you reach this equilibrium point. That's when you get enough of the molecules in the vapor phase that they're returning at equal rates. We'll see that again when we talk about chemical equilibrium. But we got to go through kinetics first. That's chapter 12. And that will be our first lab, kinetic lab. So we have a couple of weeks uh, where we don't have any labs. So in, in that period of time, you need to gather things together. You've got probably got everything you need. You've got a notebook already. Okay. You got a, um, you need a, uh, this should be our discussion during the lab period, but Stream of consciousness. Your lab notebook needs to be quadral line. I don't use none. Like this. That's the edge marks. Okay. So um, if you've already got one, right? Has it been used before? Okay. You need a brand new one. 
<clears throat> I don't have any more. Well, I do have that one that's worth a dollar, but I bought some more and, and Biden economics has kicked the price up to two dollars and a quarter. So I've got some of those if you can't find any in the store. Um, we'll talk about that later. I got to finish this in the next chapter. So there's there's the reason for vapor pressure. What's the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees C? It's one atmosphere. So that's the boiling point of water at one atmosphere. Okay, so this just illustrates the difference in uh, vapor pressure for different compounds. Um, I would focus your attention. Well, first here is if there's a vacuum up there and you're at sea level, then you're, the pressure is 760 torr. But if you put something in that space up there and let it evaporate, uh, water is going to be 24 torr in pressure, so then it'll drop the total to 736. And then here, remember the um, this is uh, ethanol. And it's not quite the right. This is an ether. This is not the same ether we were looking at before. This is diethyl ether. In fact, this is the kind of ether that we use most often in the lab. Not dimethyl, but diethyl. So instead of instead of like this, on either side, there's your methyl groups. This will be analogous to um, ethanol. So we just change the arrangement. But in this case, we've added another carbon. So that's diethyl ether. This is the ethyl group. So diethyl ether. <clears throat> but the point is that the vapor pressure of this one is higher than ethanol because ethanol has hydrogen bonding available and this one doesn't. So the, the intermolecular forces of ethanol are much stronger. And that means the vapor pressure is going to be lower than it is for this one. This one is extremely high. 545 torr at uh, room temperature, around 20 or 25 degrees, and 65 for ethanol. Uh, so, um, um, didn't make that point. Vapor pressure increases significantly with temperature because you're overcoming those bonds with the increase. You're adding energy to the liquid and kinetic energy, which is a destructive force, and it, it allows you to move more of the molecules into the vapor phase before they can build sufficient pressure to return it at that temperature. So as you increase the temperature, the vapor pressure increases. And these are examples. Um, to reach one atmosphere pressure, uh, diethyl ether only has to go to 34.6 degrees Celsius. That's less than body temperature. So if you put, if you have a gloved hand <laughs> and you drop some uh, diethyl ether in your hand, uh, for long it's all going just like that. And it also means that, uh, have you ever smelled ether before? You'll know it when you smell it. If I have a, a bottle of ether on one side of the room and you're on the other side and I open the cap, probably within less than a minute, you'll smell it over there. But the same thing can happen with uh, a bottle of booze. You have to get real close to smell it. Actually, I don't even know if you can smell ethanol. Does it have an odor? Yeah, I think it does have an odor. Yeah, ethanol has an odor. In fact, what we were doing, did we do, um, uh, as one of our last things, we did the molar mass of, uh, no, what molar mass? We're trying to differentiate between different compounds. It's gone blank. Uh, so I better move on. So um, if the forces are stronger, it takes a higher temperature to reach atmospheric. That's the point of this slide. Um, 
And you can also, using this, um, I think it's Clausius Clapeyron equation. Yeah. You use this relationship. Um, this is the original equation here. Pressure equals this uh, proportionality constant and E, you know what E is? 2.317, something or other. It's a, it's a math number. Right. Uh, natural logs, it's the base of natural mm -hmm. logs. E. Oh yeah, there it is, 2.718. Um, that raised to this power where delta H is the heat of, of vaporization. And then T is the uh, Kelvin temperature and R is the gas constant. And uh, you can determine the pressure based upon this formula, but you have to know what that A is. Right? So that's the hard part. So what we have to do is we have to rearrange the equation in such a way that we can we can get some information from it without having to know what A is. So what we end up with is this modification down here. And if we use this equation and we take the vapor pressure at any given temperature and we have a, a table, like two or more pairs of numbers, we can plot them on a graph. And if we plot, if we plot on this graph, uh, the natural log of uh, the vapor pressure versus one over the Kelvin temperature, and we plot these values, then we get a straight line. Notice with a negative slope. That's why I drew it that way. <clears throat> so the reason we can do that is because this is oops, this is y equals mx plus b. It's a straight line. Right, we did that with um, Boyle's law. Uh, to, uh, P times V equals K. If you plot P against uh, 1 over V, you get a straight line. Um, so that's one way that we can extract the information from this. Um, this y-intercept, right? We can get that from, from this part of the uh, graph. And then we can get the slope. The slope here is negative. Uh, delta H vaporization divided by R is the slope. And if we know what R is, so we can solve, we can solve for the heat of vaporization. There's one other way you can do it also. If we rearrange the equation further, then what we can do is get this equation, where if we know the vapor pressure at this temperature, and we know this temperature, then we can calculate that vapor pressure. So it's just a further modification of that earlier equation. And this should be, let me see if that's in, in useful information. At the back of each one of your uh, review documents, there are pages with useful information. Um, I'm looking for Clausius Clapeyron, but I don't see it. There's the Bragg equation. And there's the uh, edge of a, a body center cube. Huh, oh, these fat runs up there. Okay. Well, you're free to look it up. I'm sure it's in your book. And uh, on an exam, uh, it's kosher for you to have that equation with you. Because I, I haven't even memorized it. Okay, so um, if we use this information, right, 25 degrees, the vapor pressure is this, and heat water uh, from 25 to 65, with this as the heat of vaporization, then we want to calculate what's the final vapor pressure of water under those conditions. So we have all the terms we need with one unknown, we can solve that equation. But you have to be careful. That's 25 degrees Celsius. That's not Kelvin. You have to change it to Kelvin. 
and you should get 195, 94 torr as your vapor pressure for water at 65 degrees. Okay, we can represent phase changes um, in this type of a graph where we have temperature on the y-axis and we're adding heat as we go. So this is just a uh, progress scale. So notice as you're, if you have ice and there's nothing but ice there, you can heat the ice and it gradually increases in temperature until you reach the melting point. So up to that point, what we've been doing is adding energy to the ice and uh, adding kinetic energy. In fact, vibrational energy because it's still in that uh, hexagonal lattice. So they're just shaking more and more and more and more. And then once they finally start breaking apart, then the, all the energy that we put into them at that temperature goes to breaking those intermolecular bonds. So that's why the temperature stops going up. We're still putting heat into it, but the temperature doesn't rise anymore. So that's why if you have ice and water together, the temperature is constant. Okay. Once you've melted all the ice, then you can start adding kinetic energy to the water molecules again in the liquid phase. So it gradually increases until you reach 100 degrees. Now you're producing steam. Now all the energy you put into it goes into breaking the bonds of the liquid, intermolecular bonds. You're making gas. And the temperature sits there until you've evaporated all of the liquid into the gas phase. Then you can heat it some more. You can, you can superheat steam. And for many industries, the transfer of, of uh, heat uh, from one place of the factory to another is accomplished through steam lines. They pressurize the steam and they heat it up to a high temperature and they can send a lot of heat from here to there. Those pipes will usually have a big, uh, about that much insulation around them and then a protective layer of metal around that in case you get a line ruptures. Yeah. <clears throat> But that's, <clears throat> that's a demonstration of a phase change, in this case, for water. <clears throat> so this question is um, ask you whether you think the, the heat of vaporization for, the heat of vaporization is greater than or less than the heat of fusion. It's larger. Think about what bonds are being uh, broken and what the end result is. With the heat of fusion, when you add heat to a solid, you're just breaking the molecules apart far enough so that they can slide past one another. And that takes a certain amount of energy. But when you're making a gas from a liquid, you're adding enough energy where you can completely separate them. They have no interaction whatsoever anymore. So the heat of vaporization should be much, much larger than the heat of fusion. Okay, there's another way to represent uh, phase changes. And in the, the phase diagram, we're gonna identify what's called the triple point, the critical point, and the phase equilibrium lines. And for this, we need, uh, I think temperature on this, oh, wait a minute. I better go to the next slide to get it right. Yeah, temperature on this scale and pressure on this scale. So as you, um, well, let me just draw the phase, the phase lines first. For this one, the phase line might go to there and then it might go out here like this and another one go here. So in this region, at that pressure and that temperature, everything in here is a solid. At this pressure and these temperatures, everything in here is liquid. And then at these temperatures and this pressure, everything in here is gas. Now these, these phase diagrams can become extremely complex. They can have lines going every which way. They're only, uh, only engineers are interested in that kind. <laughs> for our purposes, this is good enough. This is complex enough for us. So what we're saying is, um, along this line, um, you can have liquid and gas existing at the same time, at that temperature and that pressure, right there, for instance. 
that's where liquid and gas can exist together. Okay. If we if we uh, increase the pressure further, uh, let's see. No, at this pressure, if we increase the temperature, we're gonna we're gonna be all gas. And if we decrease the temperature, we're gonna be all liquid. Or you can go the other direction, right? If you're moving this way and the temperature is constant, then as you increase the pressure, you're going from gas to liquid. Or over here, if you increase the pressure at that temperature, you're going from gas to solid. That's called deposition. Or in this case, it's carbon dioxide. If you have solid carbon dioxide or dry ice, then at this, at this uh, temperature, room temperature, for instance, then you're going to go from solid to gas. Okay, there's one point on this graph where all three phases can exist together. That's the triple point. Okay, so only at this particular pressure and that temperature can you have all three phases together at the same time. Okay, you're way out here. At some point, at this pressure, the critical pressure, <clears throat> and critical temperature, you reach the critical point. That's, this is kind of a strange universe out here. Uh, somewhere out here in this region, your material, uh, your compound in this case, exists as a fluid, but it cannot be identified either as a, a liquid or a gas. It flows. It's not solid. It flows. It's a fluid. But you can't see the difference between liquid and gas out there. This is called a supercritical fluid. <clears throat> and it's used in industry now. It used to be only research, but now it's used in industry too. Um, supercritical fluids can be formed at uh, above a certain temperature and pressure. And the neat thing about these fluids is they have extremely, they are extremely fluid. They can penetrate membranes with impunity. We used to use supercritical carbon dioxide to extract plant materials of uh, certain uh, metabolites. And the advantage that it has is it extracts them without damaging them. And if we try to extract with, a, say, a methanol reflux for several hours to get stuff out, you're always going to have some degradation of some of your metabolites that you're interested in. And you have to take that into account. But if you use supercritical fluid, you can get virtually 100% of them out of the plant material with no um, degradation whatsoever. And the other nice thing is um, this happens under very high pressure. You got to go do under high pressure, extract your material, and then your, uh, the liquid is transferred into another vessel, and then you release the pressure. When you release the pressure, gradually, of course, uh, the carbon dioxide evaporates and you're left with your extractor right there. Sometimes it'll be uh, liquid, and sometimes it'll be solid. Most often it's solid. But it's undamaged. Now, this equipment is, is pretty expensive. And it takes some specialized training. So the uses in the industry have to be high value products okay, in order to do that. And, I imagine the pharmaceutical industry uses it. Um, uh, you, could, you could conceivably uh, make uh, Sanka coffee, instant coffee out of it. Or you could extract caffeine efficiently with this. I think from a, a cost-effective standpoint, water extraction of caffeine is probably a better choice. Most often done. Anyway. Uh, so, uh, if you follow this graph, if you like, say constant pressure and move across, you'll see it goes from solid to liquid at that temperature, and depending on where you are here. So, this graph has a lot of information in it, 
um, for that particular compound. Now, if you're talking about uh, water, water's funny. This solid liquid line goes backwards. The slope is backwards. So that means as pressure increases from solid, at that temperature, as you increase the pressure, you can go from solid to liquid. Usually, if you increase the pressure, you go from um, gas to solid or gas to liquid or liquid to solid, right? but not with water. And for the longest time, um, the best explanation that I had heard for uh, the reason that skaters can, can slide across the skate without with little or no friction is because they put all their weight on that very small area of the blade and that increases the pressure beyond the point where now it goes, it's not ice anymore, it's liquid water. There's a film of liquid water underneath the blade. But there was some research done on it and kind of discounted that. They've had some other explanation, which I can't recall at the moment, but uh, it'd be a nice illustration if it worked. Okay, so um, as intermolecular forces increase between molecules, what happens to each of the following? Boiling point should go up, right? How about viscosity? Forces increase, the liquid becomes more viscous. Surface tension. Yeah, that ought to go up too. Enthalpy of fusion. That just means uh, how much heat does it take to melt the solid? Fusion is another word for uh, liquid to solid. That should increase. How about freezing point? Should increase. Yeah. Vapor pressure. Forces increase, vapor pressure goes down. Heat of vaporization. Ought to go up also. So the only one that decreases with an increase in intermolecular forces is vapor pressure. Rest of them all increase. They're proportional. This is inversely proportional. Everybody else is proportional. Directly proportional. Okay. You might need a short break. No? Okay. All I need is a drink. We go to chapter 11. Let's close this one. And go to this one. Hopefully, this one will take one. I think it's a little shorter. Properties of solutions. Now we're going to focus. We've been looking at pure solids, liquids, and gases for the most part. They want to say, what, do you, what happens when you put them together <clears throat> and make a solution? Remember from, I think we covered this in the first semester, definition of solution is a homogeneous mixture. Right? So you can have solutions of solids and liquids, like you put salt in water and make a solution. Alloy is a solution of two solids. Uh, we breathe a solution there all the time. A right, solution of gases. Uh, others, we can have liquids and liquids, like booze, antifreeze, liquid and liquid. Uh, here's the state of the solution. Here's the state of the solute and the solvent. Did we define that before? Yeah. Solution. Uh, solvent is the major component, solute is the minor component. You can only have one solvent, but you can have lots of solutes. Okay. Uh, Seawater, sugar solutions, those are what we normally associate with solutions, where you put a solid into a liquid and you get a liquid. Uh, you could even put a gas in a solid and make a solid solution. Hydrogen in platinum. That's usually... Um, you experience this one um, when you're trying to hydrogenate. Well, one example, trying to hydrogenate fats, unsaturated fats, use platinum as a catalyst, and you pump hydrogen into the into the fat, and it uh, 
it takes those double bonds and opens them up and adds a hydrogen to each one on each side, two other hydrogens. And, uh, but those hydrogenated fats are not healthy. They're all, they're all trans fats and cis fats are better. Right? Look it up. We don't have time to talk about it now. But how do we define solutions? Right? You know, if a solution is a solute in a solvent, then it's instructive and useful to know what is the composition, you know, how much solute is in that solvent for a given volume or a given mass, depending on the terminology. Well, uh, these are different ways of representing solution composition. One is molarity. We did molarity already, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, just the moles of the solute in liters of the solution. Uh, mass percent, right? That's fairly simple to, to rationalize. Mass of the solute per mass of solution. Mole fraction. We did that one too, didn't we? Moles of the solute per total moles. Right? Uh, molality. Moles of the solute per kilogram of solid. Have we used that one yet? No, we didn't. Uh, we will use that toward the end of the semester, freezing point depression. And we'll use that uh, characteristic, that property of, uh, of adding a solute to a solvent to depress its freezing point. We'll, we'll use that information in a formula I'll show you to determine the molar mass of the solute. Oops. Okay. Molarity, moles per liter of solution. So you need to know the moles of your solute and you need to know the total liters of the solution after it's formed. So that way, uh, this is like any formula. If you know the volume of the solution you have and you know what its molarity is, you can calculate how many moles of the solute you possess in that volume. That's one use for it. So if we're going to calculate molarity from one mole of sugar and 125 milliliters of solution, get check your units of measure. 125 milliliters, that's not liters. So how many liters is 125 milliliters? We want liters. Well, remember, well, you probably remember. Since I didn't have you in first semester. As the units get bigger, right? Milliliter is small, liter is large. As the units get bigger, the number gets smaller. They, they're opposite one another. So you know that this number has to be smaller than that. But how much smaller? Well, you have two choices. You can use dimensional analysis, use a conversion factor, right? So many milliliters per liter. Right? So how many thousand milliliters per liter? So a thousand into that would give you that. Right. Or you can say tens, hundreds, thousands. There you go. By the way, I've told my uh, uh, first semester class this already. If you write that number with a decimal out, sticking out there and no zero on the other side, it's wrong. I don't like orphan decimals. So always bracket those decimals in for zero. Okay. All right. So if we calculate it correctly, we have one mole of sugar in 0.125 liters. Divide 0.125 into one and you get eight. Um, and you can rearrange the equation to find out what the volume of the solution is. If you need two moles, of a sugar solution that's too molar, right? Then you need uh, 0.2 liters from it. You just rearrange the equation. Remember molarity. Molarity is uh, moles per volume. The volume has to be in liters. And it's like any equation, right? It's got three variables in it. If you know two of them, you can solve for the third. Um, 
All right, in this case, if you, do, if you have 100 grams each of sodium hydroxide and potassium chloride, the question is, you dissolve them in the same amount of water, you make the same amount of solution, are they the same concentration? No, because 100 grams of sodium hydroxide is not the same number of moles as 100 grams of potassium chloride. So you have to convert them to moles each before you can determine the molarity and it won't be the same. The only way it could be even close is if their molar masses were similar. Uh, oh, it's not gonna work it out for me. Okay, sodium hydroxide turns out to be 10 molar, whereas potassium chloride is only 5.37 molar. So what that tells me is that this has a much higher molar mass than that one does. Because for the same mass, you get more moles of that than you do this. Okay, make sense? Okay. If we need to work these problems, I will. But you probably can yourself. And there's a lot of practice in those documents too. Okay, how about mass percent? Mass percent is very simple. It's just the mass of the solute uh, against the mass of the solution. So if you know the mass of the final solution and the mass of your solute, that's fairly easy to determine because mass doesn't change with temperature. Right? If you know the mass of your solute and you know the mass of the solvent, then the mass of the solution is just additive. Real simple. So percent by mass here, and that's the trouble with percent. I've mentioned that to you guys before, but I don't know if your first semester mentioned this. When you say percent, what does that mean? Just mean parts per hundred. It's basically a mystery, unless you say what is what parts or what parts per on the numerator and denominator. It could be uh, it could be mass per mass. Right? It could be mass per volume, or it could be volume per volume. So you need to specify. That's the problem with percent. It's sort of grandfathered in. We're using percent a long time before we started to get quantitative. <clears throat> so that's why this says percent by mass. That means both the numerator and the denominator are mass. Um, so if we have 5.5 grams of glucose, we're going to dissolve it in 78.2 grams of water. What goes in the in the numerator? 5.5 grams, right? In the denominator, you still got that mass from the water, but now you have the mass from not the mass from the sugar, the glucose, but now you have the mass from the water times 100. Then you get your percent. Six point six percent. Um, let's see. If you pick up a bottle of wine or a bottle of uh, hard liquor, or even a can of beer, um, it's going to tell you what the percent alcohol content is, right? But it'll usually say percent A, B, B, alcohol by volume. That's what that means. So if um, Let's see, there used to be two percentages for beer. One was three, three, two, and the other was six, four, 6.4, 3.2. So if it was 6.4, it would be 6.4 milliliters of alcohol in 100 milliliters of beer. The problem with that is, uh, from a scientific standpoint, is if the temperature changes, um, that will also change because uh, alcohol expands with temperature, water expands with temperature, but they don't expand the same rate. 
So if you want to be very accurate in your measurements, then temperature matters. <clears throat> but most people don't care about that when they're when they're going to buy a bottle of wine. <clears throat> you just say, well, is it how much alcohol is in it? Some of them don't care. What does it taste like? Some of the fruity wines, uh, they're they're low percent. They're like 10%, maybe. Maybe low. Some of them are close to beer, 6%. And then um, the the uh, the upper class alcohols, right, the wines, like 15%. I had a professor in, <clears throat> in LSU, uh, no, uh, Georgia State University, <clears throat> um, who had a, he had a piece of property outside of Atlanta where he raised goats. And he used them in those days, the only way that you could make uh, antibodies was to uh, inject your, an animal with an antigen and they would produce antibodies against it. Then you would uh, uh, bleed them and extract the antibodies from them. And he could produce custom antibodies for his clients in addition to being a professor at the college. Well, um, he had some property and he'd go out walking on his property and it could be pretty hot in the summer in Georgia. Particularly some of his property was granted outcrop. <clears throat> so he would, he would brew his own beer it was pretty good, it was dark beer. And uh, he would put it on ice because he'd be walking for a while and he didn't want it to, to warm up too far. So he put it on ice and, and he would, uh, uh, when, he, when he bottled his beer, he would uh, throw in some extra sugar and it would continue, keep fermenting inside the bottle. Trial and error, you know, there's only so much you can do before the, the bottle would blow up. Um, but it would, he would pump his alcohol content up to, uh, close to wine. It'd be like 12% alcohol in his beer. And then he could throw it on ice. And as, as the ice melted, of course, it would dilute it, but it still wouldn't rob it of its kick. Anyway, <clears throat> mole fraction. Mole fraction is just what it says. It's a fraction, right? It's a dimensionless number. And uh, dimensionless numbers, it's important that you know where they, where they come from. So when we say mole fraction, it's the moles of the solute. That's my abbreviation for moles. The moles of the solute divided by the total moles of the solution. That's it. And sometimes it's represented with this fancy X like that. So the X of the solute would be like that. The interesting thing about this is, if there's only one solute in there, and you have a value for this, then what's the mole fraction of the solvent? Well, minus x, because it's a fraction. With fractions, you can't have anything more than one, at least not the physical world. <clears throat> so if this is like uh, 0 0.25 mole fraction for the solute, then the solvent would be 0.75. And together they would make one, make the whole. So a solution of phosphoric acid was made by dissolving eight grams of H3PO4 in 100 milliliters of water. Calculate the mole fraction of H3PO4. Assume the water has a density of one gram per milliliter. All right. Phosphoric acid solution is made. Word problems, you've heard me say this before, word problems very often are designed to confuse. Whereas sometimes they don't give you enough information that you have to go look for. Sometimes they give you too much information. I call it blue smoke. It's blowing smoke in your face, so you can't figure it out. It's, it's a test of whether you really know what you're doing, what you're looking for, what's the question for the problem. Then answer the question by looking at what information you have and devising a scheme for solving it. Sometimes it's really simple, one calculation. Sometimes you need several calculations to draw together or seven av several avenues to bring together to solve the problem. So what I like to do is extract from, from the pros and put it on the board so I can see what I've got. So in this case, we have uh, eight grams. Oops. Where's my I put it in the pocket. 
I did. <laughs> that was dead. Uh, eight grams of phosphoric acid. Okay. And we've got 100 milliliters of water. We don't know what the final volume is. We only know 100 milliliters of water. Okay. We want to calculate the mole fraction of this. Mole fraction of phosphoric acid. Right, that's where we're headed. That's the question. And we're told to assume that the density of water is one gram per milliliter. Now, why do we say that? Because if we're going to calculate the mole fraction, we have to know the moles of everything that's going into the solution. Right? And you can't calculate moles from milliliters. Right? In order to use the molar mass, we need mass. So if it's one gram per milliliter, how many grams is that? 100 grams. Right? If its density is one gram per milliliter, this is also 100 grams of water. Okay? Now we can calculate the uh, moles of each one. Right? We just need the molar mass of, some, of uh, phosphoric acid. So if you don't already have that handy, or if it's not in the problem, then you go to your chart, say, okay, three hydrogens. Three times 1.01 .01 grams per mole. Okay. One phosphorus, 30.97. And I usually only uh, have two decimal points when I'm using molar mass. And then four oxygens. Okay. So we add that up, we find the molar mass of phosphoric acid. 3.03. .03. I can do that in my head. 30.97 plus. And then four times 16 is 64. 98. So 98 grams per mole is phosphoric acid. Now we can find out how many moles is eight grams. So with a little dimensional analysis, we say this is eight grams. How do we get moles out of that? Well, we need to cancel the grams, right? It has to be in the denominator. And moles has to be in the numerator. Well, that means 98 grams goes on the bottom. Okay, I lose anybody yet? Okay. So 98 divided into eight, is how many moles of phosphoric acid we have. Okay. Okay. So that's 0 0.816. 0 0.0816 moles of phosphoric acid. Okay. How many moles of water do we have? Well, we have 100 grams. Let's see. And we need a conversion factor for water, grams per mole. So have you ever calculated the molar mass of water before? Well, let's see, 16 for oxygen, 16.00, we'll round it off to two. And then uh, two hydrogens is 2.02. .02. So that's 18.02 grams per mole. Divide that into 100. Five point five four nine four. Five four nine four moles of water. Okay. So the mole fraction, now that we have the moles of each one, we have 0 0.0816. And then the total moles is 0.816 plus 5.59493. Four nine three, excuse me. 0.5494. That's a fraction, so we don't have to multiply by anything else. So let's see, 0.0816. 
Do that again. Five point five four nine four. Plus, there we go. Divide that into it, and I get zero point oh one four five mole fraction. Let's see if I got it right. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I did it in the first semester. Did I do some of these calculations and find the slide was wrong or that I was wrong? I think I did a couple of times. I was off, I was riding off on the wrong horse. <laughs> and back up and start over again. Okay, but we're in agreement this time. That's the mole fraction for that problem. All right, molality. Sounds like molarity, but it's not. <laughs> so what's the difference? Well, the moles of the solute is exactly the same. The symbol is different. Molarity is this. Molality is little m. So molality is moles of solute divided by kilograms a solid. Okay, so we're not we're not adding in the solute here. It's just kilograms of solid. That's two things different. The solute's not part of this, and it's not volume. It's mass. Okay, the reason for that is primarily because this concentration will never change with temperature. Temperature has no effect on it whatsoever. So if we have any calculations, any procedures that need to be done where um, uh, we don't want the concentration to be influenced by temperature, that's what we use. So, uh, What's the molality of this solution? That's the same solution we had before. I should have kept all my numbers up there. Now they're erased. So if we find the moles of the solute, the phosphoric acid, which we did, and we divide it by the kilograms of solvent, so the kilograms would be 100 grams would be 0.1 kilograms, then we should get 0.016 molal. The formation of a, of a liquid solution is, this is a theoretical uh, presentation. When we put something into solution, there we can, we can visualize it as three steps. Now, all this happens at once, but uh, as I've told my other class before, nature just does what it does. It's up to us to try to rationalize it, to figure it out. And this is one of the ways that we wrap our minds around it. It occurs in three steps. One is we take the solute. Let's see, here's our solute. And we're going to put it in our solvent. Okay. Well, the solute has to be, um, we have to break. Uh, intermolecular intermolecular forces. We have to put energy into the solute to pull the solute apart from one another, the individual particles, uh, ions or molecules. Pull them apart. So this is going to be um, endothermic. You have to add energy to make that happen. Then for the solvent, you also have to break bonds, uh, break the forces. 
That's how you can make a place to put these solute molecules and make room for them. This is also endothermal. <clears throat> and then once you get those, uh, these broken apart and make holes here, then you, you put those in and reform some intermolecular interactions between the solute molecules and the solid molecules. Okay, then you can put them together. And this is exothermic. Here's where you're forming uh, new intermolecular forces. Okay. And it's the balance here that determines whether the overall process is endothermic or exothermic. You know, you can you can uh, dissolve. Have you ever been to the hospital and had and had them? Uh, you ask them for a cold pack, or they need a hot pack. They come in these plastic bags, and there's a uh, a capsule inside in in water. They're not mixed at that point, but you break the bag. You, you twist the bag and break that capsule inside. You release the, the usually it's some kind of a salt. And you release it into the water, shake it up, and it dissolves. It either gets hot or it gets cold. Well, the reason it gets cold is because it took a lot of energy to do this step and that step, and you didn't get much back. Right? The endothermic is exceeds the exothermic. Overall, it gets cold. But if you put some energy in here and in here, and you get a, a lot of energy back, it's exothermic to the extreme here, then overall, it'll be hot. It can be exothermic. Okay. So I could put that in mathematical form. In fact, yeah, this slide has it right here. So the overall enthalpy of solution is a combination of this step. This step, this step, and this step. Okay. If it's exothermic, remember the uh, the sign convention. It's a negative sign. If it's endothermic, it's a positive sign. So adding them together, if the outcome is negative, that means it's exothermic. If the outcome is positive, summation is positive. That it's endothermic and the bank is cold. Remember, um, system, surroundings, right? everything is in terms of the system. Right? So if heat flows into the system, it's positive. If heat flows out of the system, it's negative. That's where we get exothermic versus endothermic. <clears throat> that's that's one way of looking at the, the heat of solution. <clears throat> um, this is black and white, what I just said. So I'll leave it up there long enough to get on the film, I mean, on the uh, recording. And that's what it would look like. Um, it's, it's, what's the summation here, right? Put a lot of energy in, put a lot of energy in, get nothing back. It's cold. Endothermic. And this is another way of looking at it. I'm not going to spend any time on this graph. It's got the two steps here. And then you get a lot of energy back that's exothermic. If you get not much energy back, it's, it's exothermic. You get not much energy back, it's endothermic. Okay, let's see if we can explain why water and oil don't mix. Well, okay, let's see. We've got, uh, we got water over here. got oil over here. What are the forces holding them together? Oil is nonpolar. So all it has is uh, London dispersion forces. This one has hydrogen bonding. 
Okay? So it takes just a little bit of energy to break these apart. It takes a whole lot of energy to break these apart. Okay? So what happens when you put them together in step three? This is step one. This is step two. This is step three. When you put them together, what are they going to do? Well, yeah, because um, this has no, this is nonpolar. This is polar. So their only interaction that you can get out of them is London. If anything, be very small. This is going to be very small. This will be very large. You have to put a lot of energy in and you get nothing back. So they're not going to interact. That's the key here. So let's see, which one would that be? Um, Non-polar solute and polar salt. There you go. This is the oil. This is the water. The delta H for the non-polar solute is small. Delta H is large for the water. And you get practically nothing back. So the delta H of solution would be large and positive. That's, that is, it's put a lot in. And when that happens, no solution forms. It's very insignificant. Now they say oil doesn't mix with water, oil doesn't dissolve in water. Well, yeah, it does, but it's very limited. Very, very small amount. You can actually dissolve oil or grease in water. But you got to get it really hot. Right? Have you ever seen an engine steam clean? They take you go through a car wash, right? And they they got those those uh, high pressure wands that they wash you with, right? Just think of that um, instead of high pressure water, steam. When that steam hits the oil, it does two things. Right? It melts it. Right? You can blow it off from the force of of the steam, but it also dissolves the oil. If you get the water hot enough, you can put oil in solution. <clears throat> so the point here is <clears throat> when the delta H of solution after these processes is very small, you're more likely to get a solution for it. If it's very large, then you're less likely to get a solution for it. And the large delta H is results from nonpolar versus polar, either nonpolar solute and polar solvent, or polar solute and nonpolar solvent. The rule of thumb is like dissolves like, but anybody in chemistry has heard that before. <clears throat> but this is why. So the solution is going to form when you have a small delta H. So if, if they're both polar, it takes a lot of energy in on both uh, the first step and the second step. In the third step, you get a lot of energy back. And for the nonpolar, nonpolar, small delta H1, small delta H2, and small delta H3. And the difference is a very small delta H of solution. So either one of those will give you a solution. Um, <clears throat> processes that occur that require large amounts of energy tend not to occur. That's true. Um, nature is kind of stingy with its energy. It always tends toward the lowest possible energy. That's stability. Uh, factors affecting solubility. Okay, we talked about polarity already. And these are structural effects. You've either got, you've got to have, uh, you determine whether your bonds are polar and then whether the whole molecule is polar based on its geometry. Uh, that's structural effects. <clears throat> Pressure effects. Pressure effects are, are uh, valuable in explaining uh, oops, that's that. explaining gases dissolving in liquids. So if the pressure increases, 
the gas is going to be more soluble than the liquid. That's Henry's law. Temperature effects. Most of the time, um, solutes will dissolve uh, more readily in higher amounts if the temperature increases, but not always. Sometimes it goes the other direction. You increase the temperature and they drop out of solution. Um, now, back to the structural effects. <clears throat> we didn't cover all the possibilities for uh, talking about uh, polarities. And uh, we can also, uh, since water is ubiquitous on this planet, and it's often referred to as the universal solvent, um, it's instructive to talk about compounds as either uh, water loving or water fearing. So water loving would be hydrophilic here, uh, water fearing or hydrophobic. And in general, the hydrophobic compounds are nonpolar. Even if they have polar bonds, their structure makes them nonpolar. Uh, the hydrophilics, though, are the polar substances because they can interact with the polar nature of water. You can get the ele electrostatic attractions uh, of the solute and the solvent. So pressure effects uh, for solubility of gases obey Henry's law. And Henry's law just says that the concentration of the dissolved gas is proportional to the pressure of the gas in the headspace over the liquid. And then we have a proportionality constant here. So it's directly proportional. As the pressure goes up, the concentration of the dissolved gas goes up. So when you, when you open a, a bottle of pop, you hear it fizz. There's pressure, there's head pressure above the cola when you open the cap. And as long as the cap is closed, the pressure above the liquid keeps the carbon dioxide dissolved in the, uh, in the pop. Okay, this goes back to the vapor pressure. Remember we talked about vapor pressure as building up in the headspace above the liquid. Now this is vapor pressure. This is the pressure of a gas in the headspace dissolving in the liquid. They're sort of analogous to one another. As we increase the pressure by decreasing the volume, we increase the number the frequency of impacts of the gas in the headspace against the liquid, and that shifts the equilibrium toward more gas molecules in the liquid. Before they reach uh, an equilibrium where uh, the gas molecules are leaving the liquid and returning to the liquid at the same rate. So this is equilibrium, this is equilibrium, and this is what we've done in between to reestablish equilibrium over here. Temperature effects. Um, most solids are more soluble in liquid uh, with an increase in temperature, particularly for water. Most solids that are soluble in water are more soluble as we increase the temperature. But that's not always the case. There are some that are less soluble at increasing temperature. And uh, it's difficult to predict which those are. The solubility of gases, however, in a liquid decreases as we increase the temperature. The reason for that is that as you increase the temperature of the liquid, you increase the kinetic energy of all the molecules in the liquid, including the gases. And if you have more kinetic energy of the gas, then it tends to leave the surface with greater ease because the intermolecular forces that are holding it, the gas in the liquid, are overcome by that increase in temperature. So as we increase the temperature, we drive those gas molecules out of solution. 
That's why when you open a bottle of pop in the summer, uh, if it's straight off the shelf and you're out on a picnic and the bottle of pop is room temperature or temperature of whatever uh, ambient temperature is, then it will have a huge pop. But if you stick it in the freezer or put it on ice for an hour or two, cool it down, when you open the cap, it's just a, just a little spit. That's why I like my pop cool before I even open the bottle for the first time. Because when you open the bottle for the first time, if it's at room temperature, you lose a lot of the gas, the fizz, in that first spit. So I cool it down and then it, it stays fizzy longer. Because once you pour your pop onto the ice, it's gonna start fizzing for other reasons. Okay, here's some solubilities of different salts. Notice that sugar is more soluble with temperature increase. Potassium nitrate is much more soluble. Uh, sodium nitrate, sodium bromide is kind of a flattish curve, but it's still more soluble. Potassium bromide, potassium chloride is more soluble. Whereas sodium sulfate and cesium sulfate are both less soluble with an increase in temperature. Solubility of gases. Okay. Methane is less soluble. It's, this is solubility curve. Right? As we increase the temperature, it becomes less soluble, less soluble, less soluble, less soluble. Helium, however, since helium is a very small, nonpolar uh, uh, atom, it doesn't interact very well with water. You can put some helium in solution, not much, right? very little bit down here, but the temperature has almost no impact on it because there are, there's less of an intermolecular interaction between water and the helium atom that has to be broken. So changing the temperature has little effect on the solubility of helium. In fact, helium has such a low solubility that uh, we used to use in the laboratory, we would have this instrument called a high pressure liquid chromatograph. And the solution that we drive through the tube filled with packing to separate compounds we would drive the solution through at very high pressure, a couple of hundred atmospheres of pressure. And if there's any gas dissolved in it, then when it, on the other end, when the pressure is released and the solution goes through the detector, all that dissolved gas comes out of solution rapidly and uh, interferes with the detector. So we have two options. You can either put your, your solution your mobile phase, we call it, uh, under a vacuum and just evacuate all the gases out of it. Or you can do what we did and we would do what's called sparging. We would bubble helium through the solution and it would displace any of the other gases. And since helium is such a low solubility, a little bit of helium in there was not, would not impact the detector as much. So here we have uh, an experiment. And on this side, we have pure water. And on this side, we have an aqueous solution of some kind, right? something dissolved in water. Well, if you think of it as in terms of, of this, right? This is open, water is evaporating, right? This side has water and, um, and, uh, and uh, a non-volatile solute in solution. So in this case, there's at the surface of the water with the solution, there are fewer water molecules that can leave the solution because there's uh, interference of the uh, solute molecules at the surface, and there may be some intramolecular uh, actions that are holding the water molecules in that solution. So you get fewer water molecules leaving, and most of the action is between evaporation over here and recondensation over here, trying to establish a balance 
between evaporation and condensation, since if this is a concentrated solution of solute, then you're going to get virtually no evaporation of water and everything is going to be condensation. So the transfer occurs here through the vapor phase of water and you notice the volume increasing there. So how do we determine vapor pressure of a solution? We use Reynolds law. Reynolds law in its simplest form allows you to calculate the vapor pressure of the solution if you know the vapor pressure of the pure solvent and then you also know the mole fraction of the solvent. So if we calculate the mole fraction of the solute or solutes, we just add together all of the mole fractions of the solutes. Say we have a mole fraction of, uh, of sodium chloride in our solution. And then we also have some sucrose in there. Right? That mole fraction plus the mole fraction of the solvent equals one. So if we know these two, we subtract it from one and we get the mole fraction of the solvent. And if we know the mole fraction of the solvent and we know it's pure vapor pressure, then all we have to do is multiply that fraction times this and we get the, the uh, vapor pressure of the solution. It will be less than the pure solvent. Now this only works if your solutes are non-volatile. Okay. If the only volatile part of that solution is the solvent, then this works. But if, if your uh, solute is volatile like this, say you have, um, let's just say this is water. And this is uh, ethanol, right? That's my abbreviation for alcohol, the drinking kind. Both of them are volatile, okay? In this case, you've got a complicated situation because now they both evaporate, but at different rates. In this case, the total pressure above the solution is due to the vapor pressure contribution from ethanol and the vapor pressure contribution from water. So you've got to do a, a, a more complicated calculation. You've got to determine what's the vapor pressure of this one, which would be the mole fraction of ethanol times the vapor pressure of pure ethanol. And then what's the contribution from water? The contribution from water is the mole fraction of water times the vapor pressure of pure water. And that would be the total. Okay? That's the modified Rayleigh's law. Here's another way to represent that. In, in this drawing, you find that the mole fraction of one of the components increases that way. And in this one, the mole fraction of that component increases this way. So what that means is, as the mole fraction of A increases, B is decreasing. Right. It has to. As, as one increases, the other decreases. And if this one is increasing, that one is decreasing. So that says that the partial pressure of A, as it gets bigger, increases toward its purity. Right. At this point, you don't have a solution. You have pure A. But if you look at it this way, as B is increasing, 
its vapor pressure increases as more B until you get to pure B. So this is the uh, vapor pressure of uh, partial pressure of B, and this is the partial pressure of A. And the total pressure of the two can be determined by connecting the pure B and the pure A. So this is the pressure of the solution. As you get more and more A, the solution uh, decreases in vapor pressure. As you get more and more B, then the solution pressure increases. Now that's the ideal solution. These types of solutions occur only when both volatile compounds do not interact. They, they don't, you don't have any significant intermolecular uh, interactions between A and B. Now, if you do have strong interactions between A and B, then what you see is a dip. You have a dip in this curve and a dip in that curve, and that produces a combined dip this way. So if the combined vapor pressure dips like that, then you know that A and B interact very strongly. If, on the other hand, they have very weak interactions, then they may go the other direction. They may repel one another. And this con convex and this convex yields to that overall convex. So that's how you recognize whether it's a strong or a weak solute solvent interaction for two volatile compounds. Um, this table combines several items. Uh, this part of the table discusses the interaction between the components. Right? So if, um, if the AA interaction and the BB interaction are about the same as the AB interaction when you put them together, in terms of intermolecular forces, if the force between A and A and the force between B and B are about the same as A and B, then this is an ideal solution. And you get the straight line combination for Rayleigh's law. An example of that is benzene and toluene. Okay. If, on the other hand, the interaction between A and A and B and B is much less than AB, where you get a very strong interaction between A and B, you get that last graph, right, where you have um, uh, a negative dip in the curve. An example of that is acetone and water. Acetone and acetone uh, have a certain attraction. As, uh, water and water has a certain uh, intermolecular attraction, but acetone and water are very, very strongly attracted to one another. Now, if the interaction between A and A to its neighbors and B and B to its neighbors is much, much greater than A is to B, then what you get is um, the positive curve. Ethanol and hexane are like that. All right. <clears throat> so for each of the following solutions, would you expect it to be relatively ideal with respect to uh, Rayleigh's law, a positive deviation or a negative deviation? Remember, the negative deviation is a very, very strong interaction. So we have a strong interaction here, chloroform and hexane, mm -hmm. F, ethyl alcohol and water, yes, a very strong interaction. So that should be a uh, negative deviation. Let me go back. 
Here we go. This is the strong interaction where you get the concave curve. Here we go. Let's see, is it labeled? No, it's not labeled. Okay, so you get the very strong interaction here, up here. Um, this one is, is pretty much the same interaction here and here, so this should be ideal. And this one should be the uh, positive interaction, where they don't interact uh, at all. Like, uh, let's go back. It would be like this one. Ethanol and hexane are an example where these interactions are much stronger than the combined interaction. Okay, colligative properties. Colligative properties are um, identified as characterizing solutions in which the nature of the solute does not matter. It only matters how much of the solute is dissolved in the solution, is, is in the solution. So uh, a change in boiling point, if you add a solute to, to say water, uh, you add antifreeze to water, it'll change the boiling, it'll increase the boiling point so that your engine won't um, boil over and lose all its water, all of its coolant. And in the winter, it depresses the freezing point, the same solution. So your engine block won't freeze. This is a calligraphy property. We could just as easily, instead of using ethylene glycol, we could use salt or we could use uh, sugar, right? There are other practical considerations for not using those, but the effect would be the same. If you have the same molar concentration, uh, actually molal concentration of uh, solutes, you would get the same depression in freezing point or elevation in boiling point. That's a colligative property. Osmotic pressure is another one. Well, I've defined what osmotic pressure is in just a minute. And vapor pressure also will change with the amount of uh, solute dissolved in the solvent. And it doesn't matter what the solute is. Now, it does matter what the solvent is. But we have characterized that um, behavior for a particular solvent. And when you do that, then you can put any solute in there and you'll get the same effect. Boiling point elevation. Um, the governing formula for this is delta T equals some constant times the molal concentration of the solute. Remember molality, moles per kilogram of solvent. Why do we need that? Because we don't want temperature to be effect, have an effect on the concentration value. And we're looking for a change in temperature. If the concentration changes with temperature, then we cannot fix this value. It varies all over the place. Now this value right here, that changes. That changes with a solvent. So water will have a value, um, ethanol will have a value. I think in our experiment later in the semester, we use um, um, lauric acid, right? A fatty acid, lauric acid has a value. Uh, so that will vary depending on the solvent. But this amount doesn't matter what the solute is. <clears throat> And all we want to know is what is the change? So you run the experiment for pure material, 
pure solvent and determine what its boiling point is. Then you add a, a, a certain mass of solute. And then you rerun the experiment, find out what its boiling point is. Its boiling point will have increased. The difference from those two experiments is that delta T. And this is in degree C. This one does not have to be changed to K. And this will be a certain change in temperature, change in temperature degree C per molal. This one right here. So when we multiply molality times that, we get degree C change in temperature. Freezing point depression, that's actually the one we're going to use at the end of the semester. This one is very similar, change in temperature. And when we say change in temperature, these are only positive values. Even though the temperature is decreased, and may be considered as a negative value, we only want to know the absolute value. So the absolute change in temperature is all we're interested in. And this K for freezing point depression times the molality of the solute again. So this is an illustration of what actually happens uh, relative to pressure and temperature. So the, uh, the vapor pressure of pure water is right here, because remember our phase diagram, this is liquid and this is gas. So this is the vapor pressure curve for our uh, wa pure water. But if we make a solution out of it, it changes the curve over here. So at a given pressure, we follow this across at a given pressure, when we add so much solute to it, it increases the vapor pressure. But here, if we add solute to it, we uh, decrease the uh, melting point. Okay. So this is the modified solution, and this is the pure solid. And these are the values, change in temperature for freezing point, change in temperature for boiling point. All right, I'm kind of running out of time here. Um, let me see, this might be worth going into. All right, we're missing some information here. What we're missing for this problem is, uh, let's see, boiling point. We're missing this value for water. We have to have that value for water, or we can't solve the problem. So uh, I don't have it handy, so I'm gonna have to skip this one, I'm sorry. <clears throat> what we'll do is, is uh, during the review session, will actually work one of these problems. And there are several problems in your review document in chapter 11, uh, where the, you know, now that I think of it, um, hold on a second. I may have that value. Chapter 11, useful information. Here it is. Okay, we can do this problem. All right, so let's pull the information out here that we that we know. All right, like I did before, we extract the information. The solution was prepared by dissolving 25 grams of glucose. 25 grams of glucose in 200 grams of water. See, 200 grams of water. So this is the solute. This is the solvent. 
okay? The molar mass of glucose is 180.16. So I, I abbreviate molecular weight as 180.16 grams per mole, okay? And the only thing that's missing that I found in useful information on the last, one of the last pages of your review document is this value here, uh, boiling point for water, the K for boiling point of water, which is 0 0.51, 0 0.51 uh, degrees C, Uh, kilograms per mole. Notice that this is the inverse of molality, moles per kilogram. If we put it that way, then we're, we're free to cancel various parts of it. But this is molality right here. Okay, so what's our formula? Delta T, change in temperature, is equal to uh, okay change in temperature is equal to kb times molality of uh, sucrose okay what's the molality of the sucrose well we need the moles of the sucrose first so we have um, 25 grams, and we want to convert it to um, moles first. All right, so we have 180.16 in the denominator. And I'm going to divide 25 divided by 180.16. That's 0 0.1388 moles of sucrose. Okay, so the molality of sucrose is equal to that many moles per kilogram of solvent. So how many kilograms is 200 grams? It's 0 0.2000 kilograms, right? 0 0.2000 kilograms. Since we've got the units in here like that, I'm going to leave them that way, and I'm going to leave this one exactly that way. And, I'll, and it'll become obvious in just a second why that's good. Okay, so what's the change in temperature? Well, the change in temperature is uh, 100 Actually, boiling point elevation. So we're going to have a T final here, minus 100 degrees. This final temperature is what we're looking for. Uh, what is the boiling point of the resulting solution? That's the final temperature. And that is equal to 0 0.51 degrees C kilograms per mole. And that's times this value. Uh, let me do the calculation first. 0.1388 and 0.2 divide is 0 0.6938 mole per kilogram. Okay. See why I left it that way? This way, numerator, denominator cancels. Denominator, numerator cancels. And we're left with degree C, which is this value over here. So we have this minus 100 equals that one times this one, which is 0 0.3539 degrees C. So to solve for this one, we just add that one to that one. So the final temperature is going to be 100. 0.3539 3C. And 
uh, we obviously would have to round that based on our, our uh, significant figure rules. <clears throat> but the answer, oops, here we go. We rounded it to two decimal places. So 100.35 would be the temperature of that solution at which it would boil. All right. Okay. Here's another fly in the ointment. When you put a solute into solution, One of the questions you need to ask is, what happens to that solute? Is it intact? Is it a covalently bound molecular solid? And when it goes into solution, it stays intact? So every mole that you put into solution is a mole of solute in solution. Or is it something like an ionic solid, like sodium chloride? What happens to sodium chloride? when you put it in solution, it breaks apart into individual ions. Okay. When it does that, now instead of one mole of sodium chloride in solution, you have two moles of ions. And our colligative properties are based upon the total moles of the solute in solution. Now, instead of one mole, you have two. So what we do is introduce this uh, Van Hoff correction factor, the little i. Theoretically, the i for this one would be equal to two. And for any of the uh, colligative property uh, formulas, this value would go in like, for instance, the one that we just did for um, boiling point elevation. All right, we have K, and then we have a uh, molality of the solute. But then to correct it, we need that correction factor. If we put in so many moles of sucrose, then the correction factor would be one because the sucrose does not dissociate. But for sodium chloride, we have a molality of sodium chloride times two because it breaks apart. What about this one? If we used calcium chloride, then instead of the I with this case being three, because you get two chlorides and one calcium ion. That's why calcium chloride melts ice on your walk much more efficiently than sodium chloride because it breaks apart into more ions and more moles for the same amount of uh, solute. Okay. <clears throat> that was one fly in the ointment. <laughs> the second fly is a fly in the fly. Sometimes we get ions repairing in solution. This ion pairing would reduce that value to something less than two or less than three. Not much, but it is significant difference. If that pairing occurs, and it has to be empirically determined, right? no theory that I know of can calculate that value, then the ion pairing, uh, and also, <clears throat> ion pairing increases with the concentration. So the more ions you get in solution, the more likely they are to pair. So this I value can also change with concentration. It can get complicated fast. But theoretically, the I values depend on how many ions come from the dissociation of the compound.
uh, and the higher the charge, the more likely you are to have pairing. Okay, so here's our modified equation with the I factor included. Um, this one Let me see if I work this one out, it would be better than than trying to draw it. Uh, okay, I think uh, the next slide does have it drawn out uh, in more detail. So if you take 20 grams of sucrose and sodium chloride and dissolve them both in one liter of water, the freezing point of the solution is found to be uh, negative 0 0.426. So if we add solute to our water, it will depress the freezing point by this much. If you put that amount into it, if you put 20 grams of sucrose and sodium chloride mixture. Okay, so there's, there's the difference. We don't know how much of each one. Assuming ideal behavior, calculate the mass percent composition of the original mixture and the mole fraction of sucrose in the original mixture. Okay, this is a complicated problem. And that's why I was wondering if I'd already worked it out because it's gonna take some time. So there's your 20 grams of sucrose sodium chloride mixture, put it in one liter of water, and there's the freezing point depression. There we go. So the total mass of the mixture is 20 grams. That's given. And the freezing point depression is minus 0 0.426. So as far as our formula is concerned, the change, the absolute change in temperature is, four point, is 0 0.426. <clears throat> We're gonna to have to use a little algebra in this one. If we let the mass of the sucrose be X, then of course the mass of the uh, uh, sodium chloride is 20 minus X. The molar mass of sucrose is 342.34 grams per mole. We can calculate, um, we can set up a formula for determining the number of moles of sucrose as X divided by 342.34. The mass of the sodium chloride is 20 minus X. So we determine the moles of the sodium chloride as 20 minus X divided by 58.45. So there we have the moles of each one of our components, but we don't know what X is yet. The molality of the solution is the moles of sucrose plus the moles of sodium chloride. There. Now, the difference is the Van Hoff correction factor for sucrose is one and it's two for sodium chloride. And the, the freezing point depression coefficient for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius per mole hour, or 1.86 1 degrees C uh, kilogram per mole. Either way, it works. And this is the difference in, in the temperature, right? Is 0 0.426 is the freezing point depression. Okay, now we're going to the next slide and we're gonna do some more calculations. Okay, so here's the delta T. Here's the Van Hoff correction factor. We don't know what it is yet because we've got a mixture. Here's the molality overall of the solution, and here's the K value. So what we decide is I, the Van Hoff correction factor times M is equal to 0 0.2290. So these together equals the summation of these two. Right. This is the molality times the Van Hoff correction factor. And notice the Van Hoff correction factor for sucrose is one, 
and two for sodium chloride. So this is the molality of um, sucrose, and this is the molality of ions for sodium chloride, and together they equal that value. So now all we're going to do is solve for x. And this square is supposed to be a multiplier. OK. So once we solve, uh, oh, x. Remember what our x was in the beginning. Our x was the mass of sucrose. So if we solve this for x, we'll find the mass of the sucrose. And after we solve all that, we get the mass of the sucrose is 14.55 grams. The mass of the sodium chloride is 5.45. So then we can calculate the composition. Sucrose is this, and sodium chloride is that. And the mole fraction of sucrose is just the moles of sucrose divided by the moles of the total. And now that we have the mass of each one, we can determine that. And the mole fraction of sucrose in solution is 0.31. That was several steps to solve that problem. That's why when you solve chemistry problems, actually chemistry, physics, uh, mathematical problems, you've got to be very methodical, step by step. All right. So here's a, an example from nature. A plant cell has a uh, concentration on average of solutes in its matrix of 0 0.25 molar. If you immerse it in an aqueous solution with a freezing point of 0 0.246 degrees Celsius, will the cell explode, shrivel, or do nothing? <clears throat> All right, ask the question, what would cause the cell to explode or to shrivel or to do nothing? This introduces the concept of osmotic pressure. And uh, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves here. <coughs> Um, we can go ahead and do the calculation. What we want to do is find out what is the solute concentration in the solution outside the cell and compare that with the concentration inside the cell. Okay, so let's look at it that way. And we can do the calculation similar to the way we did before, only this one's not co quite as complicated. Freezing point, so we need the uh, formula for the freezing point depression. Here we go. So there's the, the difference in temperature is minus 0.246 degrees, right? And that's equal to the molality times the uh, freezing point depression constant for water, right? Because all cells uh, are have solvents of water. So we can calculate the the uh, excuse me, the molal concentration outside the cell is 0.132. Right? So here's our cell. Here's the concentration outside, 0.132 molal. And inside the cell is 0 0.25 molal. Okay. Uh, osmotic pressure is based upon the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane. In other words, through the membrane, nothing goes through that membrane except uh, gas molecules and water. Everything else stays on its own side of the membrane. And the only interaction it has is water movement. So this concentration out here 
has this is the molality of the solutes. And this is the molality of the solutes. What's the concentration of the water relative to one another? This one says that there's uh, less solute than this one. So the concentration of water here is greater than it is inside the cell. There's more water out here than there is inside the cell. When that happens, water moves into the cell. So the cell would explode. Water would continue to move in here until it exceeded the capacity of the membrane to resist the pressure and it would explode. Okay, that's what that means. Now, we should have discussed osmosis first, but this is a good introduction to the topic. Um, osmotic pressure itself that develops inside the cell as a consequence of moving water can be expressed uh, by this equation. Pi, which is the osmotic pressure, is equal to the molarity. Right? Now we can use molarity. Times R times the temperature. So the molarity of the solution is um, measured against the pure solvent. And in this case, the solvent could be water, it could be anything. All we need to know is what is, what is the molarity of the um, solution. Uh, here's an example, right? If you have a solution inside this uh, funnel, and here's your membrane, and the membrane only lets water move, or only lets solvents move, then over time, the pure solvent is going to move in here, and this is going to start to rise. Right? And it will rise until the pressure above the membrane is sufficient to start pushing the solvent back through the membrane. You reach an equilibrium. That's what osmotic pressure means. This is another example. If you have a solution on this side and the pure solvent on this side, the only thing that can move through is solvent, right? So you have fewer solvent molecules on this side than you do on this side, and the movement is favored for the pure solvent to move into the solution until you get sufficient number of molecules of solvent over here, plus the added pressure. That added pressure is pushing on those solvent molecules to go back through the membrane, and we reach an equilibrium position for the movement of solvent through the membrane, same this way as this way. Okay. This is a modified equation with the Van Hoff correction factor, I. So what you need is, uh, if, you're, if you've got a molar molarity of sodium chloride, then the I value would be two. So if we have 33.4 milligrams of a compound, Dissolved in 10 milliliters of water at 25 degrees C, the solution has an osmotic pressure of 558 torr. What's the molar mass of this compound? Okay, this is multi step. Think of the question what's the molar mass? What do we need to know to calculate the molar mass? We need to know um, mass and then how many moles. Does that mass represent grams per mole? Okay. Okay. So we need to find out the mass. We have the mass, thirty-three point four milligrams. Right. Check it off. Milligrams. What is that in grams? 
times 10 to the minus three grams. Now we need to know moles. Okay, that's going to take some work. <clears throat> the solution has an osmotic pressure of 558 torr. 558 millimeters of mercury equals osmotic pressure. And the temperature equals 25 degrees C. Now, since we're using the gas constant R, the temperature has to be K. It must be in Kelvin. So we have to add 273 to it. So that's uh, 298K. So now we should be able to calculate moles. If we go back to our formula, osmotic pressure Now, it didn't tell us whether the compound can be dissociated. We have to assume that it can. Otherwise, we're dead in the water because we don't know what the I factor is. So we have to use this formula. So pressure is here. We got that. We got the R value. And we got temperature. So what R value do we use? Which one? Well, since we're talking about uh, pressure, we will use the one for gases. 0 0.08, uh, excuse me. I forgot my numbers. What's the gas constant for gases? Oh, wait, two. Uh, point oh eight two oh six. So this R is zero point oh eight two oh six um, liter atmospheres per mole K. Okay, that's R. The molality. We don't know yet. That's what we're going to solve for. The temperature is 298 K. But this is in atmospheres. This has to be in atmospheres. So we need 558 divided by 760. That's atmospheres. Okay. Now we can solve for M. The reason I'm solving for M is because it has moles inside of it. So let's see, 558 five, divided by 760 is 7342. 0 0.7342 atmospheres, okay, equals M times, let's do this, 0 0.08206, enter 298 times. This one is 24.4539. So M is equal to this number divided by that number. Uh, let me get some more decimal places here. Let's see. <laughs> Display. Here we go. Zero point zero three zero zero two four, and this is molarity, um, moles per liter. So, how many liters of solution do we have? Ten milliliters of water. Okay, how many liters is ten milliliters? Right. Ten milliliters. Well, one, two, three, zero point zero one zero liters. Okay, so that tells us how many moles.
So this is equal to 0 0.0003 volts. So we divide that into 33.4 units. Negative. So I get 111. 111 grams per mole. Let's see if I got it right. Oh, okay. Well, uh, my value is a little bit different than this one. Okay. So I was close. I said 111. This calculation gives you 106 grams per mole. Osmotic pressure. Here's an interesting problem with osmotic pressure. And it's always puzzled me, even as a kid. I had never seen a sequoia, a tree, uh, go on those California trees, the redwoods that are huge, 300, 350 feet tall. The question I had was, how did you get water from the base all the way to the top? Eventually, I learned from chemistry and physics classes that um, a vacuum could only pull water up about 33 feet, right? That's only about a tenth as high as the tree. Right? So how do you get, how does that tree get water all the way to the top? Well, one of the theories was um, the little spicules, the openings in the leaves through which gases are exchanged. Water evaporates through those and sets up a suction. As it evaporates, it, it pulls water from the top. That doesn't work. That's been disproved by experiment. So the other, the only other possibility is water being pushed up from the bottom. There needs to be a force from the bottom. This answers the question. Is there enough osmotic pressure from water moving into the root cells, sufficient pressure to drive uh, the solution up to the top of the tree. Okay. Now we're going to skip a few steps and just go to this um, this part of the explanation. The dissolved substances in the sap of the tree roots is sufficient to set up an osmotic pressure in those cells and in the, the vessels of the, um, the tree roots uh, of about 20 atmospheres. That's really high. So the osmotic pressure in the roots is 20 atmospheres. Is that enough to raise water to the top? Okay. So what we need is to know how tall is the tree in millimeters. So that's the calculation for millimeters, 9.144 times 10 to the fourth millimeters tall is the tree. And the reason we convert it to millimeters is because when we calculate the um, equivalent atmospheres in millimeters of water, right? We know 20 atmospheres in terms of millimeters of mercury, but water is less dense than mercury. So it should move higher. 20 times 760 is how high mercury would move, but 13.56 times that would be how high water would move. And that's what this calculation tells you. We converted 20 atmospheres into millimeters of water, and yes, the water would move up to two times 10 to the fifth millimeters, and the tree is only nine times 10 to the fourth millimeters. So yes, osmotic pressure in the roots is sufficient to dry water to the top. All right, just a couple more slides, I think. Yeah, three more slides. What is a colloid?
a colloid. First of all, colloid is not a solution. Right? Colloid is a suspension. What's the difference? A suspension can be separated by physical means. A solution cannot. In other words, if you put a solution through a filter, everything goes through. But if you have a colloid, if you have a suspension, then all you need is a filter with small enough pore sizes. And you can retain the uh, solid, the suspended material in the, in the uh, filter. Colloids are a little more difficult to handle though, because the particle size is very small, but it's not small enough to make a solution. Right? It's all dependent upon particle size. Uh, excuse me. Did I skip? Oh, okay. Um, so, how do we tell the difference between a solution and a colloid or a suspension? Colloid in particular. Well, there's a process invented by a man by the name of Tyndall. The Tyndall effect refers to the scattering of light passing through some medium. So, um, yeah, I need to draw you a picture. So if we have a beaker here, and we have a, a something in that beaker, we think it's a solution, but maybe it's not, maybe it's a colloid. If you have a light on this side, and it shines a beam, a beam of light, then on this side, your eyes can see the beam, you can see the light, okay? That would happen no matter what it was, whether it's a, a solution or a colloid. But if you look at it from this side over here, I'm gonna go down here and draw the eye. If you look at it from this side, if it is a solution, there's nothing there. You can't see anything. You can't see the beam going through the water or through the, through the solution. If this is a solution, then the Tyndall effect says uh, there's no Tyndall effect. You cannot see the beam. If this is a colloid, however, the light part, the light beam is uh, reflected off of the particles, the suspended particles. And now you can see it from the side. That's the Tyndall effect. And we're going to use that during our, uh, let's see, which lab is it? See, we do kinetics first, and then we do Le Chatelier's principle, then the acetic acid. Oh, formation constant for the complex ion. When we get to lab number four, we will use the Tyndall effect because we're forming a precipitate as part of our titration. And it's very difficult to see the formation of the silver chloride in solution. So we use the Tyndall effect and one partner will shine a light through the solution as the other one drops uh, incremental amounts of the uh, potassium chloride. And with the Tyndall effect, it's easy to see the formation of the uh, small particles of silver chloride. We use the Tyndall effect for that. Okay. Um, there are various names for colloids, right? Um, did you know that a fog or an aerosol spray is a colloid?
that out of my way. <clears throat> um, in this case, we can't say solvent and solute because that's reserved terminology for a solution. So we have to use the term dispersing medium and dispersed medium substance. The dispersed substance is analogous to the solute and the dispersing medium is analogous to the solvent. So the major component in a fog is a gas, the atmosphere. And the dispersed medium is a, uh, is a liquid. The a very fall, very small droplets of water in a fog. And the term for that is called aerosol. That is an aerosol. Uh, also smoke, airborne bacteria. There's solids in the gas in the atmosphere. And that's also an aerosol. Um, if you whip gas into a liquid, like you're, you're making whipped cream, you're whipping gas into your cream, that's a foam. Or you've got a shaving cream, right? And it, um, it forms a foam by um, expelling gas into the solution, uh, excuse me, into the dispersing medium. Um, a liquid and liquid can be uh, thought of as a colloid, like milk has uh, suspended fat particles, uh, mayonnaise also. Now, um, I had a thought. Ah. Uh, sometimes we call that uh, emulsification. Uh, for milk, the way uh, fat is emulsified so it remains suspended in uh, milk. And by the way, this suspension will not settle over time. Right? Not like the suspension of, say, sand in water. You can see that settling immediately. But colloids do not settle. So how do we get milk, the fat in milk, to stay, stay uh, in the colloid, in the dispersing medium? Well, you take the milk and you drive it under very high pressure through a sieve with tiny holes. You force it through that sieve and it breaks those fat particles in very small sizes and now they will stay suspended. That's why your milk doesn't separate. Um, Years ago, I can remember as a kid, uh, milk being delivered to your doorstep by the milkman. And uh, if you let it set in the bottles for a period of time, the fat would separate and form a layer on top. That was the cream. There are various other types of colloids and I'm not gonna go into them now. So study that chart and be able to name those types of colloids. What is coagulation? Coagulation occurs when the colloid is destroyed. So how do we destroy a colloid? Well, think about it. A colloid is based upon particle size of the dispersed medium. So, if you can take those particles some way and clump them together, right, make them bigger so they can settle out, that will coagulate them or make them bigger so that they clump together and now you can actually see them with your eyes. Then you destroy the, col the uh, colloid. In many respects, the uh, blood plasma is a colloid. And if you take blood plasma and you add some salt to it or you heat it or uh, uh, an injury to your skin allows you to bleed, then the natural processes of, of clotting, one of those processes will coagulate the blood. Or if you bleed onto a table, then its exposure to the, to the air will cause the colloid to be destroyed and the blood will coagulate. 
Okay, that's it for chapter 11.